Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My boyfriend played video games the whole night, so I left. So I'm 29 female and my boyfriend is 30. He's a gamer. And don't get me wrong, I play video games myself and really enjoy spending my time playing video games. But since my boyfriend lives quite far away, we only see each other once a week. That's our quality time together. Yesterday I worked the whole day, went to the gym and then drove over to my boyfriend's house. I arrived there at 7ish. When I came in, he was playing video games with his friends. No biggie. I told him I'm going to take a shower and be right out. When I came back, he wasn't playing anymore and instead asked if I'm hungry and wanted to order some food. I thought he stopped playing and we're going to spend some time together now, but no. He ordered food and went right back to gaming. At about 9ish, our food arrived. He was still playing. Fixed myself a plate, sat down to eat. He didn't join me. After I finished, I just got my stuff and told him I'm going to leave because I'm not spending my evening watching him play video games. He finally took off his headset and told me, Well, you could have said something. I was about to stop anyways. I told him that I feel like it's common sense to not be playing video games when your girlfriend visits you and left. I was there for two hours and the whole time he was playing. He hasn't tried to contact me in any way since. When I left, it looked like he was super upset but he immediately started talking to his friends again before I was even out the door. And to be honest, I didn't feel like a jerk then and I don't feel like one now. But the more I talk to my friends about it, the more I feel like I should have said something. Maybe to some people it's not obvious that someone wouldn't want to watch them play video games the whole night. I mean, it should be, but maybe it isn't. Not the jerk. See, with me, I'm the gamer and my boyfriend isn't. Playing video games and talking to your friends while your girlfriend sits next to you waiting for you to finally notice her that's a major jerk move. Good on you, you left. Hope you had a nice evening without him. And somehow, whenever you say something about someone's gaming habits, it's always, well, I was about to turn it off anyways. Not the jerk. It's common sense to stop playing video games when someone comes over to visit. That's just basic respect. And yes, some games can't be paused. Well, bad luck. Then finish the round and turn off the console. Or time manage and don't start another round if you know your girlfriend's gonna be here in a few. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. What kind of dude would rather play video games than hang out with his girlfriend? Guy decided to scam me. Revenge is still pouring on him. First and foremost, this didn't happen in the US. Some events might be pursuable up there, but down here, it was mostly no man's land regarding the kind of scams I fell for. For the sake of this story, here in no man's land, we use the top level domain, NML. My wife is a nurse. Back then, in the early 2000s, she worked in an ICU of a relatively exclusive and therefore expensive hospital. Specifically, she had to care for patients that had undergone cardiac surgery. At the same time, I was working for a small company that was going out of business. The owners were retiring, we hadn't secured any important contracts lately, and in my country, you have to pay for employee severance unless you file for bankruptcy. So they decided to shut down while they still had enough cash to pay our severances. One day, my wife calls me and tells me about this gentleman in his late 50s that had been on the verge of passing. And after that close call, he was so grateful and stuff. We'll call him Benny Lowey. This gentleman happened to work in electronic imports, which gave him access to incredibly convenient deals. Long story short, he was so grateful he could sell us an LCD TV, a store demo unit that had been used just once and we'd need to pay like one fourth of its retail price as long as we kept it quiet because he was risking his relation with the brand. It caught me off guard. I said yes and she paid. Anyway, the only TV in the house had been a wedding present and weighed over 100 pounds. We were eager to replace it. I was naive, I know, but I thought, being her patient, she knew all the personal data from this guy, so it seemed unlikely he would target her for a scam. His father was a known businessman. Now retired and approaching his 80s, Mr. Lowey Sr. was well respected in his community and wouldn't have let his son wreak havoc. Also, my wife had acquaintances in common with Benny's brother, a known doctor of another hospital. Christmas was approaching. 
She asked Benny, who had been already discharged and back home, for advice regarding the present she wanted to give me, a phone. He hooked her up with the best she could think of. Now, I can't remember the exact model, but it was the Sony Ericsson flagship, and it wasn't yet offered by local carriers. He had access to it because of his status as a local representative for said brand. She went with it and paid. The job position. I've said my employer was shutting down, so just for the sake of it, she asked Benny if he knew of someone needing an IT guy. Of course, he said. I'll meet your husband at this place tomorrow, etc. And there I was, in a gas station, uptown. He pulled over in a luxury car. Mr. Lowey was a normal-looking guy, used a cane, and had a noticeable knee or hip pain. We sat down in the gas station coffee shop, and he told me about a mid-management position, reporting to him in a mining company I had barely heard about. He coached me on what should I say in the upcoming job interview. We spoke about salary. I was dazzled. Wait, mining? Didn't you say he was into imports? He was that kind of guy you can't pause to question because he had already thrown something extra to the mix, and this position had a better paycheck than the one I was being laid off. In the next days, we had a few phone calls. Stuff looked promising. I had been already laid off. We agreed he'd pick me up on December 24th and he'd introduced me to senior managers as the recommended help desk junior manager. I woke up extra early, put on my best suit, waited in the front yard. Hours went by. I had planned to be back before noon to arrange stuff for that night's dinner because my parents were coming over. After calling him repeatedly, he told me he had been assaulted and robbed. They took my cane and broke it on my knee, he wailed. Poor guy. I told him to forget about my interview for the time being. No, no, I promised you. I'll make it up to you. Of course, since he had been injured, he wasn't able to deliver the items my wife bought from him. That night, my mother asked me about the new job. I could not bring myself to tell her about the delay. I told her it was going fine. That night, I googled him. Nothing showed up except for some awards in the imports and customs associations of whatever. He called me to reschedule our interview, December 31st. Again, picture me in my best suit outside the house on a summer morning. Of course, he didn't show up. When I finally reach him, he tells me that, when his car had been stolen last week, they took his wallet too, which these jerks eventually dropped during another robbery, so now he had been detained as a suspect for that. He hadn't been able to pick the imported electronics on the customs office, so they had them move to another custody unit where it would take a couple of weeks to retrieve. That night, we went to my parents for New Year's Eve, and my mother asked me for the new job. It's all fine, I said. I Google him again this time with variations regarding his name or the supposed company he was setting me into. Not much showed up, nothing shady. The next call was like a week later. He told me that, because he was being involved in a police investigation, this mining company had fired him. But this was actually good, because now I was going to be interviewed to take his position as IT manager. This meant double my former paycheck and securing a position that would be a leap forward in my career. So I don't ask many questions, I was just grateful. All those delays in the end would pay off. This situation, as you have already figured out, went on and on for weeks. My interview never happened. The electronics never arrived. We had lost our money, our time, our Christmas, our hopes, and I was still unemployed and hadn't been applying for job offers since I had this one allegedly secured. I texted him somewhere in between. I texted him, why are you doing this to us? He texted back, if I wanted to, you have nothing on me, but if you stick with me, you'll be rewarded tenfold. Cue in the detective. Time went by. Eventually, my wife overhears from a coworker about this patient in another hospital she was working at. Some nurses do work part-time at other hospitals. She had fallen for it too, but her husband was a detective. So a few hours later, we were filling him in on the details of the scam we fell for. Asking around, he found a third nurse scammed by this guy. Soon enough, he was detained, this time for real and admitted to scamming people due to an impromptu invented mild dementia. This detective talks him into an off-court deal in which he gave us back every cent, but not my time nor hopes, in exchange for us not pursuing any legal action. This was a decent deal because us, having failed to make a written agreement on any of these purchases, had at most a weak claim to our money. By the way, the money with which he paid us, he had to borrow from his father and some from his brother, the doctor. Remember, this didn't happen in the US. This agreement is actually completely legal down here. So I made a blog. I couldn't go for any further legal action, but there wasn't a non-disclosure agreement whatsoever. And I thought, 
what could prevent other people from falling into this scammer's lies? Well, perhaps some Google results. So I created a blog on WordPress. It was a single post in third person telling my story. In the following days, that post's comments had a dozen stories much like mine. I made them into posts. A few of them got their comments too, telling other people's stories. In a few weeks, looking for Benny Lowy's name on Google led to this blog. In my country, you can review updates regarding court ongoing cases, except for felonies that are non-public. Searching for his national ID, which I had known thanks to our settlement, as the sued party, I could just find an eviction action due to failing to pay his condo's lease. But looking for him as the suing part, I found out he had sued WordPress.nml, our local fictionary domain, which was registered by a local guy on GoDaddy.com. Following up with this case, this guy had spent months trying to demonstrate this local guy had to take down the blog I made on the domain. Go figure. I was tempted then and there to set a post on this blog saying, if I wanted to, you have nothing on me. However, I have never attempted to let him know who's doing this. I just log in on the blog once in a while. Today was the first one in years and keep finding in the comments more scammed people. All of them in a vulnerable moment of their life. Unemployed guys, small startups looking for an angel investor, small branch salespeople pursuing a promising commission. Those who have, in time, reached a compensation or agreement. It's because Benny's now ancient father had to chip in. From what they say, his brother has gone no contact. Most of the commenters leave their email addresses and I've known of a few that have teamed with each other and succeeded in legal actions. Husband trying to financially edge me out of my expensive hobby. The backstory. My husband and I have always had joint accounts and up until last year when our third kid was born, we made about the same amount of money. We made the decision that I would leave my full-time job and work PRN so we could avoid the cost of daycare. This has cut my income in half. In addition, last year my husband started running a successful eBay store. He opened a separate account that I have no access to at all and he started taking extra money from his paychecks each week and depositing it into that account as well. He uses that money on whatever he wants. I manage our finances, budget, and pay all of our bills. I don't have a separate personal account, so all of my money is poured into our mutual accounts and he can see all of my spending. I keep spreadsheets that he has full access to but never looks at. We have savings and basically no debt aside from a mortgage and my student loans. And now, I'm a very active jiu-jitsu competitor and go to tournaments frequently. I would probably call Brazilian jiu-jitsu an expensive hobby. The last few weeks, several entry fees came due at once, totaling close to $600. I've always cleared it with him that I'm going to do a certain tournament before I sign up and then I build the fees into the budget. This was no different. And other than jiu-jitsu, I don't really spend money on anything else. He texted me while I was at work yesterday saying, not really happy about your excessive spending recently. I think you should get your own account with an allowance to pay for this stuff. This was shocking to me because this has never been a problem until yesterday and I've never spent so much money on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that we can't save or pay our bills. Then he told me that he bought a car a few weeks ago with his personal funds. I feel like he's trying to control me and financially edge me out of my hobby that he knows I love. I can give myself an allowance out of each of my paychecks but I make a lot less money than him and pretty much all of it goes to bills so it would take me longer to save for each tournament and I would have to do way fewer per year. If I want to do jiu-jitsu, I have to rely financially on him to do so. And again, it's never been a problem until yesterday, because up until last year, I made just as much money as him. Our mutual decision for me to leave my job only affects my paycheck. He can spend money on whatever he wants, like a car, without any oversight or accountability because he has his eBay store that he makes money from each month. He never tells me, but I'd say it's probably about $1,000 a month. Anyway, it started a big fight. He said he doesn't have to rely on me financially for his hobbies, so I shouldn't have to rely on him financially for mine. That our mutual money should go to bills and the kids only. Who's the jerk? Not the jerk. I would be hightailing it back to full-time work and he can start contributing to daycare for the kids if he suddenly thinks your quality of life should diminish with your income. Your contribution to the household is far more than just the dollars and cents, but if he's trying to make it about the raw numbers, things aren't going right and you need to protect yourself. Until his day job is allowing him to conduct his eBay business during his work hours, his side hustle is costing your family, so he can't just claim it's his to keep. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for telling my grandparents that my parents kicked me out? 
I'm 18, male. A few weeks ago, it was my birthday and I turned 18. As soon as I turned 18, at midnight, while I was sleeping in my room, my dad knocked on the door, turned the lights on, pulled my blanket off and told me to get up and get out of my house now that you're 18. I already knew I was going to be kicked out at 18 as my mom and dad often mentioned to me in the house, when you're 18, you're out of the house. Or they'd say something like, I can't wait till your mother and I get some alone and quiet time when you leave the house at 18. They already had plans to kick me out before anyway, so I already knew it. But I wasn't worried as I have a good slash decent savings amount of 5,000 US dollars I earned from freelancing on the side. And ever since I turned 18, I've been making a decent income as well as working full time now. I can afford an apartment in my area and essentials and some nice stuff as well. So that day that I got kicked out, I packed all my stuff in a suitcase. I left, I slept the night at my friend's house, woke up and same day I arranged an apartment through a landlord I know personally. Now I have my own apartment and I'm living by myself. Today I had a group FaceTime call where my grandparents, aunt, uncle, mom, dad, etc. were all on the FaceTime call. My grandpa asks, So, OP, your father told me you moved out right now to attend college. Which college are you attending? I told my grandpa, No, I didn't move out to attend college. I moved out because I was kicked out. My grandpa's face immediately turned from a happy, smiling face to an angry, shocked face, and he basically went off on my mom and dad. Man said words that I've never heard of before. He scolded my parents for like two hours live on FaceTime with all of our relatives on the group FaceTime call. After the group FaceTime ended, my mom and dad gave me a call personally and they were mad. They said, never before has your grandpa insulted us. Today he did because of you, jerk. So am I the jerk for telling my grandparents that I got kicked out? Not the jerk. Who does this to their own kid on their 18th birthday? They lied because they knew how their actions would look to others. If they were embarrassed, then they only have themselves to blame. I'm glad you told your grandparents the truth, and I'm so sorry that your 18th birthday was so rubbish. Hopefully, you can celebrate your birthday as well as leaving your parents behind with your friends soon. That's if you haven't already. Am I the jerk for taking my baby to see my family against my wife's wishes? We came home from the hospital five weeks ago with our firstborn, a boy. For the next four weeks, my wife did not let any of my family visit our son. Her mother and sister came over several times a week. My wife refuses to let my family see him because she doesn't want to play host. My family understands that being a new mom is stressful and they have no expectations of being treated like proper guests. I told her it's not fair that her family can come and go as they please, but my family can't even meet him. She said her family comes over to help her, which is not really true. They just hold the baby a little, and if the baby isn't sleeping, then I'm the one taking care of him while they're here. They don't clean or anything. At most, they might bring some takeout on the way over. Finally, I decided I will be taking the baby to see my parents last weekend. I got all the formula and diapers and everything I would need for a couple days and packed a bag. I thought this was a win-win because my wife could have some time to herself or come along and she would be under no pressure to host anyone. But she got mad when I told her what I would do but I told her this was happening. I am the baby's father and my family has a right to see him just as much as hers. She refused to come along and said she can't believe I'm treating a new mother this way. I left on Friday evening and didn't hear anything from my wife on Saturday, but her sister and mom were over and sent a bunch of texts basically accusing me of mistreating her. Finally on Sunday, she started sending me text after text on how I was a terrible husband, how I had taken her son, how a baby can't be separated from its mother, etc. It got so bad that I cut my visit short and drove home. She was very mad when I got home and refused to speak to me. The next day, when the baby was asleep, I set her down and tried to calmly explain to her that I am the father of the baby, so I have as much right to where he goes and who he sees as she does. We are equal parents and she needs to accept reasonable compromises when we disagree, like my family being able to see our son and she not having to host them. She called me a jerk and shouted that she gets more say because she's the one who is pregnant with him. At that point, I said if she thinks that way and the accusation she texted me, I think she really needs to see a doctor and get assessed for PPD because her behavior is not normal. She called me a jerk and said I was mistreating my position as the earner. Money was never part of any discussion. She has been giving me a near silent treatment all week, resisting any attempts to discuss therapy and her sister has texted me saying I should apologize to her for what I said. I told her sister that I had said absolutely nothing wrong in response to being accused of taking the baby and being a lesser parent to my son. 
I'm standing my ground, but I need an outside perspective. Am I the jerk? Edit. To clarify, the idea my wife might have PPD did not occur to me until after the visit with my family. Edit 2. My wife knew of my plan to visit my family several days in advance. I planned a weekend trip because they are several hours away. Edit 3. I want to emphasize this because people keep asking about it. I did not want to separate my son from his mother. I wanted her to come with us. She refused. I did not forcibly take him away from her. It was her decision not to come along and her decision not to allow my family to come to her. Edit 4. My wife is not physically handicapped from childbirth. She's been mobile and going out, including a six-hour car ride two weeks ago. Edit 5. My wife refused any options involving my family coming over. No hotels or in-town visits. An overnight visit to your family's home, over her objections as well, is very different from her family coming to visit for a few hours. You can easily imagine how your equivalency argument would be perceived by a judge if it got to that point. The more reasonable compromise was to invite your family over to a porch visit, for which you'd prepare all snacks, etc., and give your wife notice so she can plan to A. Stay inside, B. Be elsewhere, or C. Join in on the visit. You have equal say in who is invited onto the property. That would have made a more defensible compromise than taking the infant out of the home overnight and away from the mother. You're the jerk. OP. She did not want them in town or at the house at all. This was emphasized in my repeated attempts to compromise with her. She felt that no matter what, if they were close, she would have to host. Why is everyone acting like she doesn't have a right to feel how she feels about the in-laws? They aren't her parents. Therefore, she will never be as comfortable with them as she is with hers. And she's at the weakest point of her life right now, trying to heal. Edit. I just don't believe this guy is telling the truth. He has some kind of excuse or situation as an answer to any and all objections. An insane amount of, oh, well, she did this, so that makes this okay, replies to even seem like a real situation at this point. He took the baby away from her. She never did that to him. There are clearly three sides to this story. His, hers, and the truth. Everyone sucks here. Unless there's more to this story, wife's stance is either irrational or unreasonable. That said, husband's decision to whisk the baby away for multiple days instead of perhaps a day or at most an overnight trip without wife's consent is also unreasonable in my opinion. Comment about needing to see a therapist may have been well-intentioned but didn't come across that way. Therapists or lawyers, the husband or wife are going to be talking to one, the other, or both soon. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Either she is totally unwilling to compromise, or there's more to this story than we're being told. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter she has to pay $200 a month extra rent, or I'll kick her out after she made me lose my bonus? I, 53 female, have a daughter, Maisie, who's 23, who lives with me. For my work, I'm a manager at a fast food chain that I've worked at for 31 years. Due to my long time with the company, I was awarded an extra $200 bonus if my shop took enough money and I know the owner well. However, I was asked by him not to tell anyone about the bonus or he would have to take it away as everyone else would demand the same. I agreed to this and said I wouldn't tell anyone and I didn't. I'm on good terms with him and we follow each other on social media, so I refrained from telling Maisie as she can't keep secrets well. But last month, around a year after I got the bonus, my daughter found out that I had managed to pay off a credit card and wanted to know how as I didn't think I'd pay it off for another year. I told her the interest had gone down, but she didn't believe me and kept pestering me about it for days. I finally told her I would tell her if she wouldn't tell anyone else, so I told her I got a raise at work. Despite having the bonus for a year, my daughter wanted to get dinner to celebrate, so we went to her favorite restaurant, which is quite pricey. She took a picture of our meals and tagged me on the Facebook with the caption, Mom got a pay raise, money emojis, which in her words, she thought nobody would notice as nobody uses Facebook anymore. Sadly, I didn't notice until the morning after, but the damage was already done. The owner called me into his office and was very sincere when he told me he couldn't give me the bonus anymore as a colleague had complained having seen the post. I also apologized, saying I kept it a secret as long as I could as I know my daughter can't keep secrets well. When I got home, I demanded her to remove the post and told her she lost me $200 a month. She felt bad, but she told me it wasn't her fault as I didn't tell her the full extent of the pay raise and how it was so much money. I told her that unless she starts paying me $200 a month extra, that she will have to find somewhere else to live to make up for it. My oldest, Mia, who's 26, 
thinks I'm being harsh on her and that it was my fault for telling her as I know what she's like. However, my daughter pays $200 a month rent and spends the rest of her money on luxury items like expensive bags, perfume, and makeup. I'm not demanding she pay an unreasonable amount. If anything, $400 a month is incredibly cheap compared to other house prices. Am I the jerk for demanding my daughter pay $200 a month extra rent or I'll kick her out? Your boss is the jerk for making the bonus so secret and conditional and for removing it like that. I don't know if that's normal in the kind of industry you're in or the country, but in mine, that would be illegal actually. I don't know why you're focusing more on your kid than on the unfair labor practice. Yes, she was wrong for posting if you told her not to do so, and sure, charge her what she cost you. But she's not the villain in my eyes, nor are you. Not the jerk. Also, it's literally illegal in the US, federally illegal, to forbid employees from discussing their wages with their coworkers and or to penalize them for doing so. You can literally take it to the Department of Labor and they will probably either get your pay reinstated or get you a settlement. Am I the jerk for not giving my brother half of the house in business? I'm 38, male. My parents passed when I was 23 and my little brother, Adam, who's 27, was 12. He inherited my parents' money in an account with me as payee until he turned 18, but he asked me to manage the account for him after that. It paid for his needs until he graduated and got a job in 2016, and it said until 2020. I inherited the house, the family business, and massive debt. I planned to sell the business and house and move him in to live with me, but Adam had a massive meltdown and the therapist I sent him to insisted he needed to be close to friends, even though we had no other family there and my entire life was in another country. Against my better judgment, I moved 4,800 kilometers back home. I quit my old job and broke my lease, tried to maintain a long distance relationship with my girlfriend at the time, juggling my parents' business and trying to pay for a house with most of the mortgage left all by myself. I started dating Emily, now 34, when Adam was 16, and when he moved for college, he gave Emily his blessing to move in with me. We got married when Adam was 21 and we were expecting our first kid. Emily helps me run the business, which barely survived 2020. The house is paid off and I'm starting to turn a small profit again. In 2020, Adam lost his job and I gave him the rest of his money in his account to support himself and he asked me to handle the bills. Every month, I'd send him some food money and let him know his updated balance. He doesn't have enough to pay for the remainder of his lease, October, and I warned him in January that Emily and I can't afford to support him. I gave him two options, get a job and pay his rent and I'd pay his food bill or move home and live with us for free while working for the family business. He lost it, saying that it was my fault for sacrificing my life for the business and the house and that he shouldn't have to give up his life since I was supposed to take care of him. I told him I gave up my entire life for him and I struggled to keep the house and the business alive because he wanted me to. So I don't have cash to spare to support him because I have employees and a baby on the way. He insisted I sell the house and business and give him his half. And I reminded him that those were my part of the inheritance, not his. That I paid most of the mortgage and I kept the business alive and I didn't want to give up everything I worked for. Our grandparents, mom's parents, late 80s I think, are the only living relatives we have. They live in a territory overseas and refuse to take Adam or help us because my parents didn't leave them anything. So I was stunned when I received an angry phone call from my grandma calling me a greedy jerk and telling me I should be taking better care of my little brother. I reminded her that he's 27 and needs to get a job and take care of himself and I let her know that I offered him both a home and a job with me and he said no. Not the jerk. If grandma is that concerned that her grown grandson needs to be taken care of, she's free to take him in and finance his life. You've done your part and now it's time for him to grow up and do his. Not the jerk. Your brother is 27 now. You did the best you could to take care of him, but he's an adult. The only thing you've done wrong is continuing to take care of him for so long. I understand because he's your little brother, but you're his older brother, not his parent. It's time for him to start doing things for himself and to stop expecting you to do everything for him. Am I the jerk for losing it after finding out my wife let her sister and her boyfriend stay at my late wife's cabin? My late wife, while she was still with us, lived a healthy life and always loved spending time traveling and going on road trips. She was always an outdoor person, although she had a demanding career. She had a high paying job while I was earning money that barely paid for bills. We were married for five years. We bought a cabin together that we used for holidays and weekends. 
After her passing, I couldn't set a foot in it for a whole year. Everything was the way she had left it. I don't go there often, but only on big occasions when I need to feel closer to her. My family suggested I sell it, but I couldn't bring myself to do that. The idea of selling it makes me feel like I was losing her all over again, so I left it as it is. I married my now wife six months ago. I have two stepkids that are filling my days with joy and comfort, but lately my in-laws have been having issues, specifically my sister-in-law. She lost her job and she and her boyfriend had nowhere to live. We've invited them to our place for two months, then my brother-in-law took them in. My wife, days ago, told me brother-in-law had an argument with his sister and kicked her and boyfriend out. I asked when that happened and she told me about two weeks ago. I then asked where her sister and her boyfriend were staying and she took her time to answer. I asked what's wrong and she flat out told me that her sister's been staying at my late wife's cabin for two weeks now. I was stunned when I heard and I asked her for more clarification. She said she gave her sister a copy of the key to the cabin to stay there till she finds a job then proceeded to say she didn't tell me because it wasn't a huge deal. I couldn't help but lose my temper. I told her she had no right to hide this from me and let her sister into the cabin knowing how I'd feel about it. She said my reaction was the exact reason why she hid it from me. I called her selfish and inconsiderate of my feelings, but she argued about wanting to help her younger sister and said I was the selfish one for not helping family during tough times. The kids walked into the kitchen, I just stopped arguing and walked out. My wife followed me. I demanded she call her sister and tell her to move out and hand over the key. My wife looked shocked, saying she expected me to react this way, but not go as far as to demand that her sister moves out and called me cruel for making her look bad to family. We kept arguing till her sister moved out and brought the key. My wife packed her things and went to stay with her parents. She told me that my late wife was obviously more important to me than my family and that she won't come home till I get my priorities straight. I haven't visited the cabin after her sister left. I haven't been feeling well these days and I'm not ready to go see how the place looks now. I just need time to calm myself down to be able to go there. My wife is at her parents' house and she took the kids with her. I miss the kids and she won't let me speak to them, which is another problem because my heart literally feels heavy when I'm away from them. I miss them so much and can't stand the house without them there. Neighbor let their brats take all of our Easter eggs. So this happened about four days ago and I'm still livid. So for a quick background, I, 25 female, was in a pretty bad wreck a few months ago. Because of my injuries, I haven't been able to work. So between medical bills and lawyer fees, money's been pretty tight. My sister, Anna, has four kids and I have a three-year-old son. Before the wreck, I always went out of my way to make sure the kids had good holidays. My siblings and I didn't get anything growing up, so I spoil them. My sister is a single mom, so money is tight for her too, which is why I tried to be a good aunt and go all out. I decided to forego the extravagant Easter baskets from years past because it was out of my budget. I set them down and explained the situation. They understood and asked if we could do a family Easter egg hunt instead. I got cheap eggs in specific colors to make sure each kid knew which eggs to hunt for and bought name brand candy to put in them. I added a few dollars in some of them and a few little toys and trinkets I knew the kids would like. We decided to do it at Anna's house because she had a yard. It took me an hour to hobble around hiding eggs, but it was worth it. We started and two boys came sprinting across the yard with pillowcases. They started picking up eggs with our kids. We tried to explain that this was a family thing, but they ignored us. Their dad came out while this was happening and I tried to explain. I usually wouldn't mind but not this time. The dad talked over me. He thanked us for doing this and said his kids were thrilled when they saw me hiding the eggs. I'm sure you don't mind a few of their friends joining in. They're just kids and they get excited. After they were done, they ran back home. They had taken most of the eggs and had messed up the number that each of our kids got. My youngest niece had yellow eggs and they had only found two of them since the neighbor kids had taken them all. The kids were upset and I was mad. The next day, I went over to their house and asked to speak to their dad. I said that I didn't care that they joined in because they were just kids, but I needed him to pay me back so I could buy more eggs to redo it with just my family. He lost it on me. He said that candy and plastic eggs are cheap, so it shouldn't matter about paying me back because it wasn't much. He started ranting about how I should have told them to stop and how I was a massive jerk for demanding money because his kids wanted to be included in what their friends were doing. 
He called us greedy and refused to pay me just because my family was upset that they didn't get enough eggs. He basically called me stupid and told me that the point of an egg hunt was competition. I talked to my family about this situation. My sister agrees with what I did, but my mom said I was a jerk for demanding he pay me back because it was just some cheap Easter eggs and candy, so I should just let it go. Not the jerk. An egg hunt in your own yard is not an event open to the public, and you had every right to be angry. That man would have gotten told off that day, and I would have demanded that he be the one to tell his kids to put back every single egg that they stole. You don't come into someone's yard to steal things that don't belong to you, and that's what they did. If the eggs were so cheap, he could have gotten some for his own kids. If you have an Easter egg hunt next year, each egg has a slip of paper with the name of candy on it. After the Easter egg hunt, you all go into the house where you let the kids hand you their slips of paper and you hand them the candy. If neighbor kids steal the plastic eggs, they won't get the candy. I am with you. I would have been furious. That neighbor is a jerk and is teaching his kids poor manners. Having to do this is such BS, but I do think it's a doable workaround for next year. Good thinking. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you try to get the neighbor to pay you back or not? Please let us know. I would have yelled at those brats to get off my property. I don't care how old you are. You don't come onto my property and steal my crap. Months of paid vacation? I'll take it. This happened in Germany, so the laws are different to other countries, especially to the USA. I was working for a family-owned business, about 40 employees, a couple years ago. My time there wasn't the best because I had a huge problem with my boss's younger brother. He was on an early pension and officially just working on a small part-time contract, while in reality working full-time with getting most of his salary out of pocket. That I was hired meant for him that he just worked about half the hours he worked before, and having a huge pay cut because of me really ticked him off as you can imagine. He talked bad about me behind my back all the time and tried to get me fired. Dealing with him was a pain, but I didn't have to deal with him often. My coworkers were nice and the pay was good so I didn't care about finding another job, despite my relationship with my boss and his wife getting worse over time too. My boss even came with me to two deliveries to customers because his brother probably told him I would waste time during the deliveries. On one day, I had to do a delivery with my boss's wife's car because the company car I normally used was at the inspection that morning and the timing couldn't have been worse. I scratched the fender of her car on a wall when I tried to get out of a parking spot the scratch was barely noticeable, but I immediately reported it to one of my coworkers so no one could say that I tried to put it under the rug. I did the delivery, and when I came back, my boss's wife was already waiting for me. She went completely crazy, screamed at me for ruining her car without inspecting the damage before, and said that she will take the money for the repair from my paycheck. I told her that I won't pay for anything because the insurance will pay for it anyways, and that's what made her snap and ended up slapping me. I immediately turned around, grabbed my stuff, clocked out, and went to the doctor to get a sick note because of mental stress, which I threw into the company's mailbox later that evening. Two days later, I got a termination letter in the mail and had to laugh while reading just the first sentence. We are terminating your work contract immediately, or if this isn't applicable, within the legal 30 days. To people who aren't familiar with German workers' laws, it's illegal to terminate a contract immediately and within the legal period of time in the same termination letter. You can do one or the other, but not both at the same time. So I went to the government office to apply for unemployment and hired a lawyer to sue my boss for illegal termination. Over two and a half months went by until I got a court date and my boss was really upset when the judge explained to him that the termination was illegal and that he had to pay me for the last two and a half months. But the illegal termination wasn't the only mistake he made. The judge gave me two options. I can accept an immediate termination on that day and leave without compensation, or I can have a two-month salary compensation, but I have to work another month for the company. My boss laughed and said that I'm too scared to go back to work and that it makes him happy that I leave the court unemployed. He didn't look that happy anymore when I asked him, why should I be scared? Do you want to hurt me like your wife did? So I took option B and went to work the next morning. My boss's brother already was waiting for me to hand me the termination letter and made comments about how difficult the next 30 days would be for me. I checked the termination letter and after I've seen that everything was right, I just said that I'm not feeling well, turned around and went to my doctor to get another 30 day sick note because of burnout. So in the end, I had three and a half months vacation with full pay, two months salary compensation 
and he had to pay for my lawyer too because he lost in court. I could have sued his wife for slapping me, but that would have been too much stress for maybe a couple hundred year olds. Would I be the jerk if I call the cops on my son? My son, 13 male, has repeatedly stolen from us over the past two years. Each time he has denied it, even when we found proof it was him. Last year he took my husband's, male 48, bank card, added it to his Google account on an old phone, and then spent $300 on a downloaded basketball game. We found it by accident when we found him on the phone, did a search of his Google account, and found the card linked to it. He completely denied it was him and blamed his younger brother, who's 10. His brother has his own phone and never uses his older brother's. There were consequences. We grounded him and took the phone off him. The new phone is on Google Family Link, so we have a lock to prevent him buying anything. Yesterday, we discovered that someone had made two payments on our credit card, one for a laptop for $2,000, which was declined, and the other for a bike for $3,000, which went through. We spoke to our credit card company and they refused to refund the money as we had been to the store before. The $2,000 attempted spend was at a store we use, but where we have never used the card before, hence it was declined. We went to the bike store where someone had spent $3,000 and they agreed to refund the money, minus the admin fee they got charged for refunds. They told us the order was placed online and printed the order for it. They said it was a click and collect order. It had my husband's name on it, but my son's email address and telephone number. They said that they phoned the number after the order was made yesterday and spoke to the person who placed the order. They said that the person was clearly a kid and was unhappy when they said that the card holder had to be present when the bike was collected. We checked my son's email and there was no evidence of an order being placed but there was evidence on his call log of a two minute call with the bike shop the day before. We also found an email from the computer shop in his email and when we clicked on the account information, it opened in his Safari and had his username and password saved. When we went into the account, the $2,000 computer was in the basket. Despite all the evidence against him, he has blamed his younger brother. His younger brother was on my laptop in the lounge with me when the two incidents happened, so we know it was not him. My husband had left his wallet out and the card was still there, so we know the card has not been dropped or stolen. My eldest swears it was not him. This is a significant amount of money that we cannot afford and we are very lucky to have got most of it. My question is, would I be the jerk if I go to the police? Info. What are you expecting the police to do? Sounds like your son needs therapy. Seems like she somehow wants her son to be responsible for the money spent instead of her. I don't know why they didn't just return the bike or why the store would have allowed a 13 year old to use someone else's credit card. OP, he paid for it online, not in store. The card was taken from my husband's wallet to make the payment and then returned to his wallet immediately afterwards. The bike was still in the shop as they had insisted that the card holder be present when it was collected. They refunded us most of the money minus the administration fee for processing the refund. I'm confused, how can the police help you? I mean this in the gentlest way possible but why don't you parent your kid? He does not need a phone or a computer. A lot of us grew up without them. He doesn't need to hang out with friends. He needs school, home, and chores until he can fess up and realize what he did was wrong. Also, therapy is a must. ETA, I have a 17-year-old son who will graduate in one month. He has a school-issued laptop to do schoolwork. He's a good kid and a teenager. On his rare grounding occasions, I have taken their phone and laptop I paid for but never touched his school-issued laptop. He doesn't need therapy, he needs parenting. I'd ground the little jerk for six weeks minimum and take all electronics away for 12. Well, adjusted kids don't usually steal thousands of dollars and lie about it. Sometimes therapy is parenting. Well, what do you think? Should OP call the cops on her son or not? Please let us know. Aren't you glad we don't have any kids, Reddit boy? Am I the jerk for telling my wife to stop baking so often? My wife, Amanda, who's 33, took up baking as a hobby during the first lockdown and really threw herself into it. We got one of those Kenwood mixers for the kitchen and different tools and pans. She learned how to make all kinds of amazing desserts and cakes. She even discussed starting a side business one day. I know she's very passionate about it and I love that. The problem is that it's become every day now. She's a stay-at-home mom and manages to make time. I've been trying to lose my extra lockdown pounds for the past year now and every attempt is thwarted by the smell of some kind of new cookie or cake or pastry. I've actually put on weight since I vowed to lose it. 
I'm 250 pounds, which is the highest weight I've ever been. It's impossible to be healthy when there's so many home-baked goods in the house. Our entire family has put on weight too. Our daughter got a letter from the school nurse saying that she had been gaining too much, which Amanda completely dismissed. I used to take our two sons on runs with me, but they never want to go anymore. And when they do, they just moan, I'm going too fast, and they get out of breath. They want to go home to play Xbox. There's always fights as well about who had how many of each pastry, and it feels like feeding time at the animal house because they all want to get their fair share before their siblings. Call me old-fashioned or the food police, but I really don't think that kids should be having desserts and home-baked goods every day, especially in the quantities we seem to be getting through. Even my mother commented on how it seems that we've all gotten chubby. Amanda is the exception to this. I suspect a little that she pushes the treats onto me and the kids because she wants to bake but doesn't want to put on weight herself as she's always been very concerned with her weight and size. I talked to her about it and I asked her that maybe she could bake less often or give the food to other people because it's not good for us to have around the house all the time. She said that I wasn't being supportive of her passion. She said before she feels useless because she never got back to work or to her career again, even though I appreciate the work she does around the home. I told her about how I'm trying to lose weight and be healthier, but it's really challenging to keep to any goals, and she said that I should just not eat what she makes, which is easier said than done. When I mentioned the kids, she thought I was implying she was a bad mother. She says that it makes them happy, and she wasn't going to tell them what they can and can't eat if they're hungry. I told her that if they grow into obese adults one day and they wonder why that is, she'll be to blame and she hasn't spoken to me since. Am I the jerk for putting the responsibility of the family's health on her shoulders? Edit. I highlighted a part I think many people were skipping over as they are suggesting it in the comments. She doesn't want the food going to anyone else, homeless shelters, group homes, etc. Because she feels like the recipes aren't perfect yet, so she wants to keep practicing with the family. When I make those suggestions, she thinks I'm implying that we don't like her baking and gets upset. She does have anxiety, and I feel like this might play a part. Edit 2. Thank you everyone for the responses and suggestions. A few people have mentioned about eating disorders, and Amanda has a history of this. She was fully recovered when we met. It seems like that might be linked to the anxiety around her baking. Letting me and my kids have this food could be her way of making peace with how she doesn't allow herself to, or exerting control over our diets herself or our weight gain making her look slimmer in comparison. She sees a therapist once a month for anxiety, but she's not spoken to anyone specifically about eating disorders for a while, and it wasn't on my radar at all. I think I'm going to somehow find a way to broach this subject with her. I'm also going to try and get the kids into a doctor's to do some blood tests and health checkup. Actually, I should get one done too. I don't want the kids to feel in any way responsible or at fault for this, especially our daughter, so we'll also have to be gentle here but my main concern is the amount of sugar they must be having. Hopefully, words from the doctor might help Amanda see the reality of the problem and how it is affecting the kids. I don't know the route to take with the baking, but I think I'm going to have to set some boundaries with the kids. Even if it means throwing away food and hurting Amanda's feelings, it's not fair to the kids to let it continue as it is. Also, thank you to those who made me feel better about my weight loss feelings given the situation. I know it's my fault I've put on the weight, but it has felt like an uphill battle not to in this environment. Not the jerk. When the school nurse has to send a note home, there's an issue. That part really stood out to me as well. I didn't even know schools were allowed to do this, though I imagine it's not super common. It's very common. There are guidelines and required weight checks in many states. I get those letters every year because my kids are small but healthy. Not the jerk. People who are saying have better self-control probably have a much healthier relationship with food than people like you and me. My favorite thing in the world is sweets, and I love to bake, but I don't do it that often because I know it's hard to resist. I can resist once in a while if I'm very motivated, but every day, not a chance. I don't blame you at all for asking her to tone it down. It's not even that you asked her to stop baking, but you offered a good compromise of giving her finished products away to other people. If she loves baking, that's great, but it doesn't give her the right to insist that her family eat everything she ever makes. You're the jerk. Not for being concerned about your kid's health, that's reasonable, but your lack of self-control is your own fault, and blaming your wife because you can't stop yourself from eating too much is unfair. I get it, I have an unhealthy relationship with food too, but it's my relationship with food and it's my responsibility to handle it. I recommend seeing a dietitian and learning to take responsibility for your own eating habits. It's the only way you're going to be successful long term at weight loss.
Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I've got a solution. Maybe you can just give all those treats to Reddit boy and I. Mm, yeah. Am I the jerk for sometimes interrupting my girlfriend's skincare routine? I'm 29, male, and my girlfriend is 28. We've been together for a little over a year. As some background, I'm generally laid back and she can be a bit type A. Sometimes we clash because of that. She has an overly complicated skincare routine that she does every night. It's seriously five or more different steps. I kinda knew about this before I moved in with her, but it was never a big deal because we were only spending the night with each other about once a week, so I didn't realize exactly how serious she is about it. Basically, she doesn't want to do anything after her routine. She doesn't want to leave the house or bum chicka wah wow afterwards because she doesn't want to sweat or expose her skin unnecessarily after she's applied some kind of chemical. I don't know exactly what. I didn't understand this part. To be fair, she usually does the routine close to bedtime, but sometimes things will come up and I'll ask her to go pick something up from the store or things like that. We had a conversation about this because she felt like I was asking for stuff after her routine on purpose to mess with her. So she started asking me if I need something or if I want to boom chicken wah wah before she does her routine. But sometimes I'll say no and then realize I actually do want something. So I'll ask and she gets upset with me and refuses. It's only maybe once or twice a week, which isn't often at all. She says I'm being inconsiderate, but it's not like I'm doing this on purpose. I feel like she's being unreasonable and that routine interruptions are normal and nothing to be upset about. Am I the jerk here? Edit. Goodness, I didn't expect to wake up from my nap and be torn to shreds. Way too many comments to respond to. I get it, I need to say sorry and I will when she gets home tonight. To answer some of the most common questions I've seen that I didn't already answer. The store is a couple miles away and there are no public transit options available that late. I can't afford to Uber and my girlfriend won't let me sync her cards to my Uber account or anything. My girlfriend offered to pay for a driver's ed course, but what's the point if I don't have a car? She wouldn't let me use hers because it's really nice and I'd be too new of a driver for her to be comfortable with that. I don't think that being a new driver means being a bad driver, but okay. And I'm looking for a new job. I just wanted to take a little time off to relax, so I haven't been intensely applying, but I do apply for jobs at least once a week. You're the jerk. Let's break down some of your comments here. You can't drive for some reason. You're almost 30. It's time for you to figure out a way to manage this that does not involve your significant other being at your beck and call. Learn to drive, get a bicycle, set aside enough money for Uber or a taxi, plan your day to take advantage of whatever mass transit is available. Pretty much anything to be an independent adult here that doesn't expect his partner to run all his errands at a moment's notice. The items you need are not life and death. You're just worried you won't remember them later. Even assuming you have some sort of executive functioning disorder that affects your memory, dude, there's an app for that. Actually, there's about a hundred apps for that. Everything from a notepad on your phone to a shared Google Doc with the person you have doing your shopping for you. You could even go old school and put a paper notepad or whiteboard on the inside of your front door to write things down when they come to mind. It's time to put some coping skills into play here. This is not a nightly routine. This is a few times a week routine. It's important to her. She even asks you if there's anything you forgot before she starts, which is way more accommodating than she needs to be. You're the jerk. You sound extremely self-centered and selfish. It's very normal for women to have skincare routines that are five plus steps. She literally warns you before she does it to avoid this exact issue. If you aren't intentionally messing with her, you must be extremely selfish. If you need something from the store after she's done her bedtime skincare routine, then maybe make a note for yourself to get that thing tomorrow. She's not your maid. She's not your mom. She doesn't have to get you something from the store because you might forget you need it the next day. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Homeboy must look like Brad Pitt or something. Don't know why else she'd be with him. Stiletto heels and rubber floors. I, 30 female, used to work for a company that outsourced a lot of graphic designs and media work to other local contractor companies. Normally my manager, 49 male, would be the one to visit these contractors with a brief and storyboard designs, but occasionally I would attend instead. We'd been working with this particular contractor for a few weeks and on quite short notice I was asked to cover a meeting. No problem, I said. I get along well with my manager and he'd even loaded our van with all of our materials. Three to four flip charts and eight or nine small boxes of blank product templates. I had not visited this particular graphics consultancy contractor before, but when I arrived, it was clear that they had drawn inspirations for their office layout from Google. 
You know the type. Colorful wallpaper, beanbag chairs, arcade machines in the break room, etc. Everybody was dressed casually. Jeans, t-shirts, trainers. I didn't think anything of it until I was shown to the room where we'd be having our meeting. I think they called it the Inspiration Activity Suite or something. No doubt, where they'd do office yoga at lunchtime or something. There were three employees from the contractor in the meeting and just me from my company. Anyway, I straight away noted that the floor was that soft rubber style that you normally see in gyms and kids' playpens. I was in my standard office attire, which included a pair of high heels. I could clearly see that this floor was not high heel friendly. To be respectful, I went to take off my heels before I stepped into the room. I was asked by one of the guys, who turned out to be their illustrations director, please put your shoes back on. I politely pointed out that I didn't think my heels were suitable for the floor and perhaps I should leave my shoes at the door. I was told again in a slightly less friendly tone, you must wear shoes at all times in this building. I politely smiled and said, that's fine. Would there perhaps be a different room that we could use, please? This time I was told in a pretty direct tone, this room is fine. We never have any issues when your manager visits. I think this is suitable. Can we focus on the project instead of critiquing our personal protective equipment policy, please? That little dig annoyed me. I'm a customer in their office. I'm the only one wearing heels in the entire building, and I'm trying not to ruin their trendy office space. Plus, there was no industrial equipment in this office. What was their PPE policy if everyone was wearing jeans and trainers? Anyway, I took my two steps into the meeting room and could feel my heels sink instantly. Well, too late now. It's a safety policy, I thought to myself. The malicious compliance? I set up each storyboard several feet away from each of the others and moved them around a few times in the meeting. I brought in all the boxes and laid them out on either side of the room, even though we didn't need the boxes for this meeting. I made as much effort as I could to walk around and be as animated as I could throughout the entire session. At the end of it, I surveyed my work. I had left little heel imprints everywhere I had been walking in the room. The floor wasn't technically ruined, but it was definitely less sightly than it was before I walked around on it. I'm not a big lady. I'm 5'7 and about 160, but obviously the soft rubber floor wasn't designed with stiletto heels in mind. I'm not quite sure if the contractor guy had figured out why I had originally asked, but they seemed a little bit quieter when we shook hands at the end of the meeting. They even offered to let me wait in reception and they'd bring all the storyboards and boxes out themselves. Just grab a coffee, they said. We'll get your equipment for you. I visited their office again a few weeks later with my manager. I purposely wore flat shoes that day and they had put up a big sign outside that particular room saying, no unsuitable footwear. By the time we finished the project about six months later, the rubber floor had been removed and replaced with a more traditional carpet. I'd like to say there was more to the story, but I never went back to that office and they lost their contract for not being able to deliver the required samples for three separate projects. Perhaps they weren't wearing the correct PPE. Something about those trendy offices always screams, we have horrible upper management, so we're trying to hide it by looking good. Karen demands my beach house. 10 years ago, my parents passed within six months of each other. I was 33, male at the time, and my little sister, Sarah, was 23, female. Losing our parents at such a young age has been rough for the both of us, but probably more consequential for Sarah being such a young adult. Upon their passing, we inherited their home, a paid-off beach house on the Central Oregon coast. I pled with Sarah to keep it with me as a joint asset slash vacation home. Honestly, a lot of my motive was looking out for her and the fear of giving a 23-year-old her the one and only inheritance in one fell swoop that she could conceivably blow through and have nothing to show for it in a few years, especially as she was grieving in her natural party phase of life. I wasn't rich by any means, but was modestly comfortable with a steady job, an employed wife, we're both nurses, and we purchased a townhome together a couple years prior. I saw the house as an appreciating asset, an opportunity to generate a modest monthly income that we could both use. Plus, who doesn't want a beach house in the family? We both lived in Portland, three and a half hour commute from the property. I saw it as an easy way to generate some steady income, but she wanted to cash out and move to California. Despite my pleas, I had no authority to stop her. The house appraised at $260,000 and my wife and I made the decision to buy her out, thus taking on a $130,000 mortgage. She got her check and did the things I feared she would do. Started with purchasing a new $40,000 SUV, YOLO'd to LA and leased a swanky apartment with her friend. 
I didn't hear much from her for the next couple of years as she partied it up and blew through the remainder of her money, then moved to Vegas for a while, finally coming back to Portland two years ago with nothing to show for herself. As for me, keeping the house has been a struggle. It cost us countless expenses, bad luck with lousy tenants. In hindsight, we couldn't really afford the mortgage and I look at it now as a decade wasted and unnecessary struggles. The good news is the house is probably worth $420,000 now. We have three kids, a four-year-old girl and twins born last year. Our townhome is crowded to say the least, so we're looking to cash out the beach house and sell our home to buy a house to fit our growing family. I mentioned my intentions to Sarah, who freaked out, saying I can't, and that home is all we have left of our family, which is ludicrous. We didn't grow up there. Our parents bought that house four years before they passed with settlement money. I never lived in it, and Sarah only did for less than a year. She says everything I said about keeping it in the family was a lie, so I should sell it back to her for what I paid. I can see the manipulative BS aspect of her play here, but I think I feel pity and guilt for her because it seems like she's finally legitimately dealing with the trauma of our parents passing and emotionally clinging on to this house as a piece of them. I'm not giving it to her, wife would never let me, but kind of feeling like a jerk. Am I the jerk for not giving my neighbor's kids good food? So I know that this is really stupid, but some of my friends have told me that I'm in the wrong here. To get started, here's our cast. We've got me, female 38. We've got neighbor, female 32. We've got my husband, male 39. We've got kid one who's eight, kid two who's seven, and my kid who's eight. My neighbor moved in not too long ago with her two sons. Seeing that she had a lot of unpacking to do, I went over to her house and offered to babysit her kids for her. She thanked me and walked her kids over to my house. I kept some of my son's toys from when he was younger, he's moved out already, and set them up in my yard. My daughter is fairly extroverted and immediately went outside to play with them. It was around noon at that time, so I started to make lunch. I made some turkey sandwiches with American cheese, a simple lunch that we always have. I brought out some plates so that the kids could eat outside on our benches. The kids loved it and 30 minutes later the sandwiches were gone and they were back playing soccer and tag. A few hours later, the neighbor's kids and my kid marched inside and sat down, tired. I put on some cartoons and told them I would be right back as I left to go get the neighbor to pick up her kids. She looked tired, but was happy that she didn't have to deal with the boys running around while she unpacked. She came over and took her boys. By this time, my husband was parking in our driveway, home from work. My daughter had a fun time telling her father all about the day while I ordered pizza on my phone. About five minutes later, while I was still asking what everyone wanted, I heard a knock on my door. It was the neighbor. I thought she was going to thank me again, but she got angry and shouted at me. The following is some basic dialogue from what I can remember, though this did happen a few weeks ago. Me. Oh, hey neighbor. Neighbor. Look, we need to talk right now. Me. Oh, sure. What do you need? Well... My sons told me that you gave them sandwiches for lunch. Me. Yes, I did. They really li- Well, that is not enough for my boys. They're growing boys, and they need to have good food, and not whatever you gave them. Me. Really? Yes. No. And I shut the door in her face. My daughter didn't really hear any of our conversation, but she asked me. I just told her that the neighbor didn't like sandwiches. She didn't bother to ask further and watched some shows in her room. My husband just laughed and so did I. The lady got mad that I fed food to her sons for free, right? But as it turns out, three of my close friends told me that I was rude and I should have given them something better. We had mashed potatoes and some leftover pork that wouldn't take more than 29 minutes to heat up and serve, but I didn't feel like giving them that. I don't see the problem with what I did, but I trust my friends and I want to know if I should apologize. So Reddit, am I the jerk? My sister demands I hire her to be my wedding planner. I, 26 female, am getting married to my fiance, 27 male, on June 24th of next year. We have done a few things on planning it, but it's very stressful and we both work full time. Plus, I'm in grad school, so we just don't have the time. Well, I called my mom about two weeks ago and mentioned how hard planning a wedding was, and she told me that we should invest in a wedding planner. Duh, I can't believe we forgot these exist. She also said she could recommend one to us, but I told her I'd have to have a talk with my fiancé about our budget and we'd see. Then we talked about other stuff and that was pretty much how it went. 
Well, my fiance and I have talked with a few wedding planners since then and we found the perfect match for us. She's been so great and so helpful and I'm so thankful for her. I talked with my mom a few days ago and told her that we'd found a wedding planner and I thanked her for the advice. Well, my mom told me that she was trying to nudge me to hire my sister, who's 29, as she's just getting into the wedding planner business and that's what her recommendation was for. Now I love my sister and I think she's great, but I also know my sister and she's not great on staying with jobs. She was not good taking orders and quit stable jobs. She started a resin business that didn't take off and she didn't want to market for it. She got caught into a pyramid scheme which she barely got out of. My parents paid it off and the last time I heard, two months ago, she was trying to be a nail technician. I told my mom that I love my sister but I want a professional to do my wedding. Well, come to find out that my mom had me on speakerphone and my sister was in the room with her. This led to my sister grabbing the phone from my mom and telling me that I'm a stuck up jerk and that I'm pretentious and I need to get off my high horse and other things. When my mom finally took the phone back, with my sister still yelling, she told me that I was being mean and unfair and that I should just give my sister a chance, to which I said no again because her attitude to rejection just solidified my opinion. My mom told me I was being judgmental and that she wouldn't answer my calls until I apologize to my sister and hire her to plan my wedding. My fiance is obviously on my side, but my dad said I should at least apologize. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The position was already filled before the sister offered her services. It would have been better to simply say that, but I don't blame you for, very reasonably, pointing out all the reasons that this was a bad idea. If you apologize, do it for you, not them. Do it for a drama-free wedding, but know 100% that you are not to blame. Well, what do you think? Should OP hire her sister to be her wedding planner or not? Please let us know. No, but she should uninvite her from the wedding and the mother. The sooner you kick idiots out of your life, the better your life will be. I told my brother-in-law he can have an opinion when he starts paying bills. I'm 35, male. My wife is 38, female, and her brother, Ian, is 44. He just lost his job about six months ago. When his lease was up in February, he asked if he could stay with us temporarily. My wife and I agreed he could until he found a job. Things were fine at first, but then he just started giving his opinion on everything. He asked if we could be quieter at night after 10 since we wake him up when we go to bed. It seemed like he was telling us when to go to bed. He makes requests for dinner daily like we're his personal chef. I told him to make himself at home and he's more than welcome to use the kitchen. He said he doesn't know how to cook. He asked us to get a different detergent because ours makes him itchy. I told my wife he can buy his own laundry detergent. He must have some money because he goes out with his buddies on Friday night. I could go on and on about his opinions. Things got worse and Ian acts like this is his house and he's in charge. I was watching TV the other day and he came into the living room and said he wanted to watch the baseball game. I said, doesn't the TV in the guest room work? He said, yeah, but I like this one better. I kept my show on and he stood there for a few minutes like he expected me to turn my show off, then went back in his room. I have my daughter who's 12 this weekend, not my wife's daughter. Yesterday, my daughter asked us if her friend could come over today and my wife and I said yes. Her friend was dropped off at like 11. They're basically watching TV and playing video games, not being loud or obnoxious or anything. Well, Ian walked into the living room and asked her friend who she was. Her friend said her name. Ian looked at me and asked to speak in private. We went in my office and he said, It'd be nice if you cleared it with me before letting some random kids come over. I said, First of all, she's my daughter's friend. Second of all, I don't need your permission. It's our house. He said, Well, I live here too, and I don't want kids I don't know running around. I said, You live here for free. You can have an opinion when you start paying bills. He went and talked to my wife after our conversation and then left. My wife said she knows his outspoken nature gets on my nerves, but it was rude to throw not working and being unable to pay bills in his face like that, and now he feels unwelcome. Honestly, good. He should feel unwelcome. Maybe then he'll get a job. Every time I tell him about a place hiring, he says, that's beneath me, or I'm too smart to work there. A job is a job. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your wife is the problem now. It started out as a brother-in-law problem, but once your wife took his side, she became the problem. His refusal to work is not your problem, 
and now it seems he's using weaponized incompetence to get his way. Honestly, good for you for not responding to the bit about clearing it with him. How is the wife okay with the brother trying to tell her daughter what to do? It's not the wife's daughter, so she probably doesn't feel like it matters as much. Not the jerk. It sounds like he thinks because he's your wife's older brother, he ranks in the hierarchy of your household somehow. Time to throw him out, dude. It's time for Ian to move on. Why would you put up with this in your own home? Let brother-in-law crash with someone else until he finds a job. Tell him exactly why. He came in like he runs the place, and you're not okay with that. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for wanting my sons to stop excluding my daughter? My wife and I have four kids. Three boys, who are 26, 25, and 23, and a girl, who's 20. Some of you might wonder if we kept trying until we had our daughter, and unfortunately, you'd be right. We've always wanted a daughter, and I'll admit that this desire made us less than ideal parents to our boys. We were so fixated on the idea of a daughter that we heavily favored her after she was born, much to the detriment of our brothers. Through therapy and counseling, we now know that we have made them their sister's scapegoat, turning our daughter not only into a spoiled golden child, but also a common enemy for the boys and the bearer of their resentment. Their childhood, I think, made them especially as close as brothers, but it only served to highlight just how much they despised us and their sister. By the time we realized our mistakes, it was too late to undo the damage. The eldest two had already cut us off, and less than two years of therapy and counseling did next to nothing for our youngest son. He graduated high school and we never heard from him too since. We are saddened that the boys couldn't find it in them to see that their sister is also a victim of our failures, but we agreed to give them the space to heal at their own pace. This changed when we found out that our oldest is about to be married to his fiance. We didn't even know he got engaged. We had to find out from a distant relative's congratulations post on Facebook. We were hurt, but mostly we understand that we no longer have the right to expect an invitation. We warned our daughter not to snoop and to just let what happens happen, but she didn't listen. She found out that our oldest posted about how much he loves his brothers and couldn't choose between the two of them which one would be his best man, so he's going to have them both share the same role in the wedding. Our daughter is understandably upset and sees this post as a deliberate snub to her. My wife and I do feel that the post is unnecessarily inflammatory and doesn't need to be posted to the public, regardless if he was expecting for us to read it or not. We tried to contact the boys once more, and to our disappointment, the first thing they said to us in years is that we all are formally uninvited. Our daughter hasn't stopped crying since. Their mother and I have accepted our estrangement, it's the consequences of our own actions. But is it bad for us to want for our daughter what the boys had found in each other? The way we see it leaving things to fester might do just as much harm as trying to intervene at this point. So, am I the jerk for reaching out to our sons on our daughter's behalf? You're the jerk. It sucks that your daughter is now being punished for your and your wife's failings as parents, but guess what? Her brother's wedding is not about her. Tell me, does she keep in constant contact with her brothers? Does she really know anything about them at all? If the answer is no, then why should she expect a place of honor among his wedding party? You are still making her the golden child and scapegoating your sons. Go back to therapy. I was just about to type the same thing. They aren't done with therapy. What OP described is exactly the behavior they said they were aware of and were trying to stop. I don't know you, OP, but I want to go no contact with you too. Ugh. Yep. Son number one posted something about how fortunate he is to have two amazing brothers and couldn't decide which one he wants as his best man, so they will share the honor. And somehow, OP and their golden girls see this as a deliberate snub and unnecessarily inflammatory. What? It's not about you or how you feel. These boys spent 18 plus years worrying about how their parents and sister feel. It's not about them anymore. You probably aren't even on their radar. These boys are out here living their best life. And if the shine they put out casts you in the shade, then that's a you problem. You're the jerk. So let me see if I have this right. Your oldest is getting married, an event that is entirely about and managed by him and his wife. He made a post praising his brothers for the support the two of you never gave him, and yet again, you made it about yourselves and your daughter. You literally went right back to the same crap they cut you off for. You didn't call to ask if you could attend. You didn't call just to give him congratulations. No, you called him to guilt trip him for not involving y'all in his wedding party. 
So once again, you condoned your daughter's selfishness and chose to support only her again. If it was your daughter and they threw a fit, wondering why they weren't in the wedding planning after being estranged, what exactly would you tell them? The answer you're ashamed to give is the reason you're disinvited. Am I the jerk for blocking my mother for taking a gift that my boyfriend bought me? I spent my birthday, April 13th, with my boyfriend a couple days ago, and one of the gifts included a ceramic cupcake. About a month ago, we were sharing stories about our childhood when I mentioned a particular story that I didn't realize still bothered me. A long time ago, I went to a pottery shop where I painted a pre-made ceramic cupcake at my friend's birthday party. I chose the cupcake because you can store small things, for example, jewelry in it. I worked really hard to paint it and it looked really nice. It looked so nice that my mom wanted it for herself. So we played a game of cards. If my mom won, she got to keep the cupcake. If I won, I got McDonald's. Unfortunately, I lost. A year later, I talked to my mom about how I wished I didn't bet the cupcake and she offered to play another round of cards. In the end, I won, but she refused to give the cupcake back. This resulted in an argument, but with me being a kid, I couldn't really do anything about it. Fast forward to a month ago. I brought this up to my boyfriend while joking around. However, he said I seemed really passionate about it when I was explaining it. So he tried to find something that matched my description, and considering that he's never seen it, I would say he was pretty spot on. I really appreciated the gift because it showed how attentive and caring my boyfriend was. As such, I kept the cupcake on my desk so that when I'm studying for my final exams, I could look at it and be reminded of positive thoughts only. My mom came today, April 16th, to celebrate my belated birthday. When she entered my room, her eyes immediately went to the cupcake on my desk, so I explained to her the story behind it. She laughed and said, wouldn't it look nice if I had both? I laughed with her, but deep down I was annoyed. Throughout the night, she kept making side comments about the cupcake, but I mostly brushed them off. When she had finally left my place, I entered my room to see that the cupcake was missing. I called her repeatedly until she finally picked up. At first, she said she didn't know where it was before finally admitting that she put it in her purse. She claimed that she wanted to take a picture of the two cupcakes together. I was so upset that I immediately hung up. My mom lives about two hours away and it would be hard to get there without a car. This made me feel teary eyed and eventually I started crying. Between this and final exams, I felt very overwhelmed. I sent her a text message basically saying how upset I was and she apologized, but I was still upset. I told her, don't call or text me. Send me an email if it's an emergency and blocked her phone number. However, after thinking about it, I'm starting to feel bad. Am I just overreacting? Am I the jerk? ETA. Wow, I didn't really expect this to blow up. The incident with the original cupcake happened when I was in grade 5, so I was either 10 or 11. Calling the cops is not an option. She pays a good chunk of my university expenses and her job requires her to have a clean record. The last thing I would want is for her to get fired. My mother does have a history of mental health issues. She was diagnosed with depression and bipolar disorder in 2015. I won't go into details, but I feel like permanently going no contact with my mom might cause her to spiral again. This is partially why I feel like a jerk because I know how much my mom depends on me for emotional support. The cupcake isn't an isolated incident, but it's been years since I've had any major issues with my mom. I wish I could share all the stories I have with her, but then this would turn into a novel and I'm sure the mods wouldn't be too happy with that. Not the jerk. What is that lady thinking? Taking the first cupcake made her a jerk, but this is the icing on the cupcake. Exactly. She derives joy from seeing you upset at her hands. Keep the boyfriend, maybe get a new cupcake, but ditch the mom. Let her have her cake and eat its cold hard, daughter doesn't call you on Christmas, crunchy ceramic too. Agreed. There's a few things going on here and they're all unpleasant. 1. The mother took something, the first cupcake that OP put energy and caring into creating. She did it because she could and very likely because she knew her daughter valued it. Sometimes people want things not because they like them, but because they know someone else does and they find joy in taking that thing away. 2. The mother knew OP had a new thing that she valued, something someone who loves OP gave her. The mother knew this and once again wanted to take away the thing that made OP happy. This time it wasn't completely about the cupcake. This time it was about someone else showing OP she was loved. OP's mother wanted to take that away also. 3. 
OP's mother would have known her daughter was studying for final exams. She would have known that taking the cupcake would upset OP, and throwing OP off her study, she is interfering in OP's potential exam results and attempting to take something else off OP, her future success. OP's mother seems deeply jealous of the things OP is given or creates for herself and isn't above sabotaging OP's happiness so she can feel powerful. Not the jerk, OP. Keep your mother blocked and don't share your success with her. She'll only try to take it for herself also. Get in, losers. We're complying maliciously. We all do stupid stuff in our 20s. Well, for me, it was moving into a shoddy apartment with my fellow mental health risk friend. We were both well aware that we may have to break lease at some point, so we found an apartment that was just barely within price range and had the option to break the lease early. It was okay at first. There was linoleum peeling up in the bathroom, and if we didn't wipe down the window seals, and particularly the far corner ceiling of my bedroom, then we would get mold. But this is Oregon, and I'm familiar with mold. No biggie. When our washer, which we were paying an extra $100 a month to have in our unit, started leaking, we put in a maintenance request and tack on the peeling linoleum as well, since they'd already be in our unit to fix the washer. They patched up the washer and did a half-attempted job at repairing the patch of linoleum. A month later, the linoleum, since they had not actually fixed the underlying problem of the peeling linoleum, it had come up again. The corner had cut my foot, and the bathroom sink, washer, and dishwasher all had problems of one kind or another. They came in again, said that if we wanted them to fix that patch again, it would cost $450 to replace the whole floor. The patch was like a two-foot square, so that just never got repaired. Two months, three hospital trips for my roommate, a still broken washer that was unusable, a leaky washer, and a close call later. Roommate has POTS, fell down the stairs. We put in a request for accommodation to be released to our respective parents on the grounds of mental and physical disability. They denied us the request, simply offering to move us to a downstairs apartment. They don't want to let us out of this lease, even though my roommate was in serious danger? Fine. Malicious compliance incoming. I went through the lease agreement to figure out how much it would be to break the lease, and I quote, Fee to break this lease is $1.50. 1.5 times the rent if left blank. Someone either messed up the paperwork or figured that no one would read it. So I put in a 30-day notice of intent to move out, with $1.50 worth of quarters in the envelope. Aftermath. They tried to tell us we couldn't move out because it is 1.5 times the rent, not $1.50. Threatened us with lawyers, called their bluff, suggested they repaid the lease agreement they signed, paid my half of the repairs, and haven't heard from them in like three months. Still keeping all the emails and such in case I get a letter from a lawyer still have zero intention to pay that 1.5 times rent. Force me to take a lunch with no one else to open the doors for your employees? Enjoy! Some backstory. Okay, so I'm a grocery assistant manager, and in my supermarket chain, that generally means two things, besides what you would expect job functions of such a role to be. One, work overnights while we are closed, which I love, and I'm the person with the keys to the store to let employees in and out, which I hate. My shift starts at midnight. They're supposed to schedule two key holders during the night shift, specifically so that lunches can be taken. In our state, they are supposed to be taken between the third and fifth hour of work, or the employer must pay an hour of overtime. Well, besides store management, there's myself and two other key holders. My fellow assistant, whose schedule they changed to only be overnight on my days off, and a produce clerk, who comes in at 4 a.m. three days a week. This means a minimum of two days a week, I'm the only key holder on duty during my lunch window. Malicious compliance time. They started bugging me to take a lunch. They were getting flagged from corporate about my overtime hours. I said, so you want me to work during my lunch to let people in or out? They aren't dumb enough to say yes to that. They said, well, you know what times people are scheduled, so plan in between. They're right, I do know. I know the people who are always early or late. I know the floor cleaning company has no set time they show up, and I know when the smokers are scheduled for their breaks, and I know there is no 30-minute uninterrupted window for me to take a lunch. After telling the store leadership this and them not listening, I decided to show them and started taking my lunch. The first night, a smoker lost it on me for not leaving the break room to let her out during my lunch, and she missed the chance to smoke on her break. 
I explained my situation to her and got her to redirect her yelling at store management when they showed up. The third night, the floor company called our store during business hours to complain about their rep having to wait outside for 15 minutes to be let in. One night later, a bakery clerk left and went home after them being 5 minutes late meant I wouldn't be answering the door for 20 minutes. That was the last night they made me take a lunch as the only key holder there. It's finally over. I became a horrible neighbor to stop another one. This is amazing. I think it's really over. Three years ago, my neighbors moved in to the only house that is next to me. We directly share a yard with a thin privacy fence. It all started right after they moved in. Whenever it was not raining, they were in their backyard all day, screaming, shouting, crying, mostly the kids, but the parents too. Also playing music. This didn't bother me. They have a really small backyard, but somehow managed to fit a pool, trampoline, and sandbox in it. Recipe for disaster. When it was raining, I constantly heard bangs through our thick concrete wall because the kids were running electric toy cars into it, the big ones. I know this because one kid slammed into my garage door once. Imagine getting woken up every day by screaming. Whenever you come home from work, screaming. Having dinner, screaming. Well, you get the point. For two years, I gave them the benefit of the doubt since we were in lockdown. But start of this year, I asked them to be a bit more considerate. It was in a friendly way, but they got mad and told me to move if I don't like their noise. After that, it only got worse and worse and worse, like they were doing it on purpose. One day they complained because I slammed the door at 12 p.m. Said, okay, sorry for disturbing your peace, but now you know how annoying it can be, so could you also be a bit more considerate? Those are not quiet hours. At this point, it was very obvious that this was some kind of weird power play and I was done with these clowns. The noise couldn't get worse, so I started retaliating. Installed cameras that were visible. Installed a sound system as close to their yard as I could. Then I started becoming the most noisy neighbor ever in the non-quiet hours. Whenever I heard noise, I started blasting rap music with loud bass, started throwing parties, barbecuing as often as I could. It was actually horrible, and I'm glad I don't have other neighbors. Literally, after a week, the noise started to go down. Two weeks ago, they asked if we could exchange phone numbers so that we can contact each other when the noise is too much. Haven't been bothered since. I'm obviously very happy, but why are people like this? Why do I have to resort to these childish behaviors just to live in peace? Life lesson learned, I guess. Want proof we are working? Proof you will get. I worked in a bank's back office for over a decade. Towards the end of my stay there, we got detached from one department and moved to another during a general restructure. While there, we get talked down on and called stuck up and unfriendly. Mind you, because of compliance, we sit in a secure environment that allows little interaction to non-staff of the unit. As a result of some beef the head had with us, stemming from not understanding our duties, we got a new unit head who came in with the same attitude saying we were blowing our jobs out of proportion and that the general opinion is that we were lazy. She wanted to be copied in every mail we sent out as well as receive all our standard operating procedures, etc. The thing is, in our unit, we had like five subunits and she had no idea. No one had asked us for structure or our job descriptions. They all came with preconceived notions about us. I was tasked with sending the procedures, work manuals, job descriptions, and team strength. We shared all our unit email passwords and that's when it starts to dawn on her when she saw one mailbox having over 500 emails and only three people attending. Then we started copying her in our mails. In a day, we got no less than 200 mails and sent more than that, and that's one subunit only. So she got copied in everything, every single mail from five subunits. In three days, she came running, asking us to include her in escalations and irrelevant mails only. My colleagues, ever mischievous, turned a deaf ear. We continued to copy her for about three weeks and even included her in automated responses. She missed her own relevant mails because her box would be filled with over 1,000 emails. After a month, she sent someone to plead that we stop, which we did, somewhat. She opted to be removed from the unit head position after that and gave the department head a report. Safe to say, we got some respect after that. It was just so sad that they treated us as such without any attempt to understand what we did. In the end, occasionally, she would still get copied in like 20 mails a day, till I, later a team lead, asked them to stop. 
Give me a hard time when I'm serving you and your friends? Okay. Years ago, I worked at a busy, corporate sit-down burger restaurant. One day, I'm hustling through the lunch rush, and I have six college guys sit down. One flags me over and loudly pronounces that they're ready to order right away. What are you guys having? I ask. Guys? The same guy says with a smirk on his face. Guys? That doesn't sound like a very professional greeting to me. I work at a restaurant too, and if I walked up to a table and asked, What are you guys having? My manager would definitely let me know that was inappropriate. The other guys at the table look kind of uncomfortable at this exchange and just silently sit there. The main guy looks around at all of them and keeps going. Why don't you come up to us again and do it right? At this point, I'm looking around at my massive section of tables and getting the distinct feeling I'm going to be at this table forever. I'm trying not to lose my cool, so I smile. Sure, I say. Take several steps back and walk up again. Gentlemen, how are you all doing? Ready to order? The main guy smirks and nods. I look directly at him. How about you, chief? What are you having today? Some of the other guys laugh. He looks angrily at me, but orders his burger and a drink. I get everyone's order and hustle off. I return with drinks a little while later. I set everyone's drinks down and do the main guy last. Here you go, boss. I leave before he can say anything. Through the course of their meal, I call him a bunch of different nicknames every time. You need a refill, pal? How's your burger, buddy? Need more ketchup, bro? Can I get that plate out of your way, dude? Any dessert for you, amigo? Need me to split your check, brother? Make sure to leave me one signed copy, muchacho. So by this time, this guy is boiling. His friends are loving it though. As time has gone on, the rest of them keep looking at me expectantly. What nickname next? Finally, they all get up to leave. Lunch rush has ended and I'm chilling at this point. I casually walk up to them. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. The rest of the group is smiling. I look at the main guy. And you, have a fantastic day, hoss. The rest of the guys cheer. They all head out. I grab all their receipts on the table. Surprise, surprise, the main guy left me zero for a tip. I didn't care. It was all worth it. Am I the jerk for telling my brother I wasn't excited about sister-in-law's pregnancy? My brother Matt and his wife Lucy have six sons. Their youngest, John, is two and was born with a chromosomal abnormality. It's so rare that the doctors aren't entirely sure how this will affect him in the future. Currently, his development is much slower than other kids. Matt and Lucy have been taking him to all sorts of specialists, a speech therapist, and a physical therapist. Their insurance covers some, but not all of this, and the out-of-pocket fees can get pretty hefty. From what I know of their finances, they're not struggling, but they also don't have much to spare. Three months ago, Lucy announced that they were expecting another kid and made it clear that this wouldn't necessarily be their last. I was immediately concerned, but tried to ignore it and be excited and supportive. I congratulated them, was super enthusiastic at their gender reveal. Basically, I did my best to hide how I felt, but it didn't work. Matt approached me and my boyfriend at a family gathering to ask what was wrong and why I seemed more thrilled about our sister's puppy than his wife's pregnancy. I tried to play it off like it was nothing and I just had a lot on my plate, but he was insistent. My boyfriend tried to deflect by joking that I had run out of ways to show my excitement the seventh time around and boy, did Matt not like that. I decided to just come clean and tell Matt that I knew I had no right to tell him how many kids he could have and that I would love my new nephew just as much as the rest of my nephews, but I assumed he would stop having kids after John so that they could focus as much time and resources on him as possible. He was upset and said that just because John has a special need doesn't mean other kids will. I explained to him that I was more worried about them having enough money to afford the best possible doctors and therapists for John and enough time and energy to advocate for him and help him. He said they always wanted a big family and John doesn't change that and they can always get the older kids to look after the younger ones when something with John comes up. I said six kids already is a big family and it was unfair to expect that of his older kids. He blew up and told me I had no idea what I was talking about because I don't have kids, and I probably won't since I overthink so much, I would talk myself out of having them for even the smallest of risks. And when you have kids, you just make it work. I told him I don't think assuming he could just make it work was a good idea. And I was sorry, but I couldn't force myself to be excited when he hadn't said anything to ease my concerns 
and that maybe I was a bit more excited about our sister's new puppy because she triple checked that she had the finances, time, and appropriate environment before adopting. He grabbed Lucy and stormed off, and I haven't heard from them since. I texted an apology because they won't take my calls. Edit. Thank you all so much for weighing in. I really do appreciate it. I've seen and read some comments saying I think John is a burden slash unloved and I was basically telling him to not have the baby. I just wanted to say that that is not the case at all. I adore John. He's my godson and such a smiley, sweet blessing of a baby and I'm sure I'll feel the same about my new nephew. My concern is coming from the fact that we have no idea what John's future will look like. Some people with this condition are adults who are living independently while others require care for the rest of their lives. Just because John has needs that their other kids don't doesn't make him a burden. Burden implies that we're not happy to give John everything he might need or want and that couldn't be further from the truth. Boss tries to give disciplinary action for working too hard. Midway through my career, I found myself working for the most prominent private college in my state. I was in the IT department and was in charge of maintaining a few servers and all of the technology in classrooms. Every summer, we would receive our budget for the year and the part of the budget I managed was spent mostly on upgrading the audio and visual presentation systems in the classrooms, and most of that work had to take place during the summer. This is fine, normally, but our college administration had created a ticking time bomb for me a few years before. They had decided to spend about $100,000 on a few classrooms, but did not allocate any money in our budget to replace that equipment when it would eventually fail. I had been there for five years, and now that equipment was starting to fail. Increasing our budget was not an option, despite faculty growing to depend on the equipment in these spaces. I was left to figure out how to make the same budget replace all of the equipment in those spaces as well as the normal set of classrooms that would need to be upgraded elsewhere. Fine, I was up for the challenge. I had to simplify and purchase more value brands of equipment and do extra work to cut corners. A couple of weeks of shipping delays for the majority of the equipment saw me with roughly one month to rip out replace, rewire, and configure around 15 classrooms, as well as update and test all of the existing classrooms within about a month before the semester began. Realizing the amount of work ahead of me, I began working. I came in every day of the week for 28 days straight, working 8 to 10 hours to ensure that when the semester began, the professors would have working equipment. I was salary, so I did not have to clock in. This gave me the freedom of scheduling work as little or as much as required. I worked myself sick and was literally sick at the end of the 28 days. My supervisor was a guy we recently hired, let's call him Gus. Near the beginning of the semester while testing equipment, I realized that the audio driver and a common model of computer we have in the classrooms was corrupted. Investigating it, I realized that the computer manufacturer had corrupted drivers on their web server where we downloaded it from. I asked my supervisor who was in charge of managing the image deployment server to rebuild the image with a non-corrupt version of the driver I had provided him. He said he would. I swing by the next day and ask him if he had completed the rebuild. He had not. I tell him I really need it as the semester loomed closer and closer and he tells me he will work on it. Next day, nothing. Day after that, nothing. Finally, he figures it out and I continue my work. He must not have liked being pressured and perhaps the perception that he was incompetent. He was, must have gotten to him. He decides to power trip and call me into his office and ask why I was working so much. I explained the administrative oversight a few years prior, shipping delays, cheaper equipment, extra required work, and his delaying of a working image. I tell him, look, I came in day after day after day asking for that rebuilt image. Each time I said day, I'm poking my finger straight down on the edge of his desk, enough that it makes a sound to emphasize that those delays hurt the work I was doing. He wanted to find some personal failing that he could pull out some form of disciplinary action around. I gave him none. Eventually, he ran out of ideas and I left his office, not thinking much of it. Gus, however, was a jerk of the highest order. He would follow our IT director like a puppy. He joined a band with my IT director, so my work situation was not exactly fair. The semester began and not a single issue in all of the classrooms was reported. I was proud of my work I was able to complete given the challenges. The second day of the semester, my IT director calls me to his office. There, Gus is sitting beside him and they both want to talk to me. I don't like the looks of this. 
My IT director starts asking me about why I was working so much. I explain to him, as I did Gus, the various factors that made this summer's work extra challenging. This destroyed any valid criticism they could muster. Gus goes on to say that he innocently inquired about my work and that I became violent, talking about the gesture I made on his desk, illustrating his failure to do his work in a timely manner. I demonstrate exactly what I did on the IT director's desk to show how ridiculous this claim was. My IT director wanted to exert his authority and they would not stop until they had something to discipline me with. Nothing I would say would change the result. I was to be in trouble for whatever transgression they imagined up in this meeting. I make sure to point out how long it took Gus to do the small task that I depended on, knowing I could have completed it in about an hour. He was incompetent. My IT director then alludes to the fact that I should respect Gus more as he is my supervisor. Forget it, I think to myself. I then tell my director, it is as if Justin Bieber was trying to teach you about music theory. It's only going to upset you. This sudden, sharp, and in my opinion, hilarious comparison was too funny. Both Gus and my IT director immediately laughed, even though Gus was subject of this insult. Once they had stopped laughing, my IT director put on a more serious tone. He says that I could manage my time better, despite the unique circumstances of this summer's work. His voice gets really soft and slow while he's talking to me now. This is a trick he forgot he told me that he uses in arguments to make the other person seem like they're out of control. It's condescending, as if spoken to as a child. And now he's using it on me. He tells me that he wants me to take some time management class, also to take a couple days off and think about it. I just want you to think about it. However, he's going to need my keys and badge. Cue malicious compliance. At this point, he has provided me enough evidence that this is not a job I want to stay at. The absurdity of working so hard and for 28 days straight on salary with no extra pay and to be rewarded with a disciplinary action was too much. That in that moment I had thought about it. Without saying anything, I hand over my badge. I took all the many keys off of my key ring and set them on his desk. I have thought about it. I tell him in the exact same soft and condescending tone he used with me. And you can keep the keys and badge. I told him with the biggest wry smile on my face. I then walk to my office. He follows me and I notice his eyes become glassy, as if he was hurt by the situation unfolding before him. He expected me to capitulate and accept his punishment for a job well done. He kept saying, I just want you to think about it, with each time becoming increasingly desperate, and I kept repeating, I have thought about it. He disappears back to his office with his little minion, Gus, to discuss damage control. I quickly pen an email to all my other coworkers, letting them know I was leaving and that I enjoyed working with them. I had to work quick as I knew they would shut down all my accounts very quickly. I packed up my personal effects and left. Gus and my IT director offered to help me trying to walk back the situation with some small gesture of goodwill, but I was gone. I had been there for five years, but I was willing to walk away the moment he tried to treat me so poorly. I found out a little later that the week before I left, a programmer we hired left after he treated her poorly too. I was not aware of the reason she left when she did, but our office manager shared that she quit abruptly like me without anything lined up given his behavior. About a year later, I hear from the office manager that the IT director had left. Rumor is he was primarily working for another company while in his office at the college, effectively double dipping or making money for two jobs while only doing one. He had been caught doing so and was warned by the administration to stop. He opted to leave instead of owning up to his own dubious behavior. My only regret is that I didn't leave that job sooner. Am I the jerk for saying I wouldn't be playing mom with my ex's affair baby? My ex-husband and I divorced four years ago because he cheated. He had an affair baby, Juniper, who's three, with the other woman, but Juniper's mom ended up passing. Aside from my ex-husband and his family, she doesn't have anyone else because her mom grew up in the system. He and I have four kids, Joshua, who's 20, Cassidy, who's 16, Nate, who's 11, and Jacob, who's 8. When we divorced, Joshua cut him off and Cassidy followed him soon after. They don't visit him anymore and they've never met Juniper. He has always blamed me for that because I kept his kids away. He might be an awful husband and partner, but he's an awesome dad, I'll give him that much. Nate and Jacob still visit him and they're close with the baby. I tried once to take the three of them out when she was younger, but it wasn't for me. 
I know she's blameless, but I can't separate her from my ex's betrayal. So now, every time I pick Nate and Jacob up, I try not to engage much. If she says hi, I say hi back. If she waves, I do too, but nothing more. Now, every time I pick them up, she starts to mumble, Mama, Mama. I'll tell her things like, No, Juniper, I'm not your mom. Call me by my name. I'm fine with that. Last time, she actually ran at me, calling me Mama, and began to cry when I didn't pick her up and take her with me. Listen, I don't think my ex is telling her to call me Mom, but that's how Nate and Jacob act, especially Jacob. He runs at me saying, Mom, Mom, and hugs me. So I guess she's copying his behavior. Yesterday, my son spent Easter with my ex's family and Juniper ran at me again. I said hi and my ex asked for a second, which I said yes. He basically told me that seeing me picking the boys up, being affectionate and loving with them is confusing and hurting Juniper. She's a baby and she doesn't understand what's happening. So he asked me if I could just take her with me for a few days like I do with the boys and maybe over the time, let her call me mom. I said absolutely no, that I'm sorry for Juniper but that I won't be playing mom with her and that I'm only keeping a relationship with both of them because of our sons. He called me heartless and pointed out how she cries when I leave without her, but I said that it wasn't my problem and that he should deal with that. He later sent a video of Juniper crying by the door and said, I hope you're happy. So am I the jerk? I mean, I know it's not her fault, but it isn't mine either. It's a shame you can't divorce him twice. That's called a restraining order. Not the jerk. I'm so sorry that the baby is hurting. She's of the age where I'm sure she's trying to figure out her own little world. Part of that is copying her big brothers, and I commend you for shutting her down kindly. But your ex is a piece of work. He cannot ask you to support him, and he definitely cannot ask you to take the kid off his hands. He had a supportive parenting partner, and he threw it all away when he cheated on you. Exactly. He needs to tell Juniper about her mommy and differentiate that her brothers have a different mommy. Juniper is innocent in all of this, but OP is not obligated to parent her as she is not her mom or stepmom. I can't believe the ex is trying to guilt trip her with a video of Juniper crying. Such manipulative behavior. He messed up by having an affair and one that resulted in having a kid. He needs to parent Juniper and not force his ex to play mom because Juniper's mom has passed. Noisy neighbor destroying packages. I have lived in the unit I'm in for about two years. My upstairs neighbor has always been extremely noisy, and when I say extremely, I mean that I cannot sleep because there are very loud stomps, screams, dog running noises, hammering, cutting, and God knows what else. I've made several complaints to the administration, and after months of zero results and my health and job performance starting to be affected, I contacted the unit owner directly. The noises ceased for the most part, at least at night when I sleep. According to the administration, this neighbor is supposed to take meds and often doesn't, which triggers strange behaviors and is the reason why he has a service dog, which I have multiple times seen being mistreated and yelled at by him. He also is known to the police and has gone to court for crimes. One day, doing who knows what in his unit, he did something that caused a leak so bad that it ruined my bathroom ceiling, my kitchen, and my bathroom fan. It also leaked to the unit below me. That's how much water there was. I've been trying to coordinate with the owner of the unit to have that fixed, but that is also taking time. Because I've been communicating with the owner to have him stop making noises and stop doing things that cause massive leaks, I believe this neighbor started to dislike me, much like he does everyone else in the building. He's threatened people, yelled at, and mistreated some of them as well. The suspicion that he doesn't like me became a concrete fact after another neighbor pulled me one day to tell me something. I had ordered something online a few days prior and the package arrived completely smashed. I spoke to the company that sent it and they sent me a new one. I thought it had just been an accident, but what the neighbor told me is that he saw my upstairs neighbor stomping on it. He saw it with his own eyes. This situation is starting to get out of control and I don't know exactly how to proceed. Should I speak to his owner? To the administration, the police, file a lawsuit? Any advice is welcome. Thanks in advance. File a complaint with the police. Damaging mail is illegal. Also, contact an attorney to find out what your options are. So sorry, that sounds very scary. Do not approach this person. Document everything. If you can get a door camera, that would be a good idea. As for your useless landlord, when you have water damage, they legally have to fix it. Call your local Department of Housing Code Enforcement. You can look it up online and file a complaint. 
they will come to your apartment and do an inspection. Then your landlord will have a certain amount of time to fix it before they will be given fines. Am I the jerk for revoking my mother-in-law's access to my twins after she only took one of them to the seamstress instead of both? I'm 35, female. My husband is 30, male. And we've been married for five years. I have 15-year-old twins, Anne and Rachel, from a previous relationship. Their father is very much still involved, but they also love my husband dearly. Aside from some minor stuff, like Anne being thinner than Rach, Rach having darker freckles and a long scar on her leg, they look exactly the same. When we got married, my twins were very much well accepted into my husband's family. He can't have kids of his own, so his parents were very much pleased with two girls in the family. At the beginning, she treated them just the same, but as they're growing up, my mother-in-law grew closer to Anne. I've always suspected that it has something to do with Rach's weight. Mother-in-law is pretty skinny too. My mother-in-law and ex-mother-in-law were pretty excited to plan their sweet 16 because that was the only thing Anne talks about. I could see Rach less excited than her. She thought that she would be tossed aside because Anne is more girly, while Rach likes darker stuff, but that wasn't the case. My ex-mother-in-law went above and beyond to have both of them included, and they chose a My Melody and Kuromi theme so it'll match. My mother-in-law was talking about how beautiful their dresses would be, how she'll ask her daughter-in-law to be their MA and such. My ex offered to pay for all of that, but my mother-in-law said no. The party isn't until November, but yesterday my mother-in-law went out and took Anne with her. She was supposed to help her with some stuff, but my mother-in-law surprised her and took Anne to a seamstress, one of mother-in-law's friends, so her dress would be custom. My girl came home so excited and happy, but I saw Rachel on the verge of tears. I asked both of them to go to their rooms. I could see my husband begging me not to, but I asked her why did she only take Anne and not both? She tried to act stupid because she went from, I thought their father was going to buy her dress, to, I planned on taking them separately. I called it BS, and she said it was not her responsibility to pay for both of them. And I said, sure, but you don't get to play favorites. I said she was uninvited from the party, and I'll be paying all of her money back. She wasn't allowed to be with them anymore until I said so, and that, at least, she should apologize to Rachel. My husband took my side, and my mother-in-law left my house crying. After she left, I called Anne down and told her that my mother-in-law won't be coming to the party and that her custom dress was canceled. I explained to her why, and she understood just fine. She even said sorry to Rach. My father-in-law called us and said that I was so wrong because they're two different girls and shouldn't be treated like one. He tried to berate me, but I just hung up. Am I the jerk for that? I know they're different, but is it wrong that I don't want my mother-in-law to exclude Rachel? Not the jerk, and thank you for sticking up for your daughter. Rachel is going to remember this. Your father-in-law is right. They are two separate girls and shouldn't be treated as one. But that doesn't mean one gets a custom dress and the other doesn't. If mother-in-law meant to treat them equally, get them both custom dresses, she would have spoken to you about getting them both to the dressmaker on the same day. Separately would have been even preferable, so they could have both had the experience of getting fitted as a surprise. But she didn't do that. She planned on leaving one kid out, which is not even remotely fair. Now, if this is a first-time offense, I might advise not being so harsh, but that's up to you, and you're not the jerk. Right? If money was an issue, she could have talked to the parents about splitting the costs, so both girls could get custom dresses. If that didn't work, then find a different thing to do that is inclusive and in her budget. Instead, she played favorites, hurt the feelings of her other granddaughter, and damaged her relationship with both. OP was absolutely in the right. It's incredibly rude to pick one grandkid over the other. It's so cool that the chosen sister got how crappy that behavior was and moved to make it right with her sister. Parents are guiding these girls right. Also, way to go husband, backing up his wife. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people get treated like crap by their in-laws and the spouse doesn't do anything to stand up to their parents. This guy gets it. Seriously, these parents are rock stars. You're the jerk. You spoiled everyone's day and possibly week or months to throw a tantrum and ban mother-in-law from your grandkids in the party. There's plenty of time before November to buy a second custom dress. I can think of several ways it could have been handled tactfully and Rachel could have been taken to the dressmaker the next day. You could have just said, thank you, when mother-in-law said she was going to take the girls separately and then work out who pays. You're the jerk. People do bond differently with different kids because some personality combinations gel more than others. Yet, you immediately assume it's about the weight because you're superficial. 
Everyone doesn't have to be treated the same, just like your kids might have a favorite grandma or aunt. As long as mother-in-law is not being mean to Rachel, you need to back off and stop trying to control and rule over everyone like a dragon. You <laughs> like a dragon? <laughs> you have no idea if she was going to get Rachel a fitting later. You could have explained you thought it was unfair. Everything doesn't have to be met with anger and banning people. Try discussion and understanding. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or mother-in-law? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for telling my son's teacher to buzz off when she tried to force me to invite 24 kids to his birthday party? I got a call from my son's teacher today. He's six. Let's say her name is Miss Goldbaum. She says, Hi, are you Al? Fake name. Father? I say yes and ask if everything is okay. She tells me that she understands he's having a birthday party and that he invited a few of his friends from class, but not everyone. I said, yeah, there are a few kids in there that he has problems with, and also, I don't think we can really handle hosting 24 kids and their parents. She then tells me that there's a rule that if any kids in the class are invited, that all kids in the class are invited. I told her it's an event off school hours on private property in my home. She can no more tell me what I do there and who I can and can't invite anymore than I can decide who was invited to her Thanksgiving dinner. She then tells me that there's a good reason for this rule, since kids get their feelings hurt if they get left out. So then I pointed out to her that there are 24 kids in the class. If their parents attend the party with them, then that'll be an upwards of 72 people, and I told her that's just not a reasonable thing to ask. I also point out that he has friends from other classes attending, so do I have to invite that whole other class too? She then said, Al is in my class. He is under my supervision. This is my rule. I then tell her that Al is only under her supervision while he's in class. I'm the one throwing the party, and she doesn't get to make rules for my house or me. She then said if it involves her class, she does. After a bit of back and forth on this, I lost my cool. I said, Lady, it's pretty clear that you're used to bossing around kids who have to listen to you and that you don't seem to understand that your little fiefdom ends at the end of the school day and doesn't go further than schoolhouse gates. I'm not a six-year-old in your class. I'm a 38-year-old union electrician planning a private event in my own home, off school hours. If you think you're the one to make the rules for me in my home on which I pay the mortgage on, you can go forget yourself, and there isn't a darn thing you can do about it. She then kind of stammered, and I ended the call. My wife agrees that the school has no business telling us who we can and can't invite into our home and that they don't make rules for our house. However, she says I went too far in telling Miss Goldbaum to go forget herself. I am very comfortable with telling her that she has no right to tell us who we can and can't invite into our home and that it's crazy I might have to invite up to 72 people for my son to have any friends from his class to attend. But in truth, I do kind of wish I left that last go forget yourself part off. But my friends at work and a few other parents tell me someone needed to take her down a peg since she was acting like this and she deserved a lesson about overstepping. So am I the jerk? Edit. To address a few common questions or things people bring up. First, we invited roughly 9 out of the 24 kids in his class. One or two may be from other classes. I'm a little embarrassed to say I'm not totally sure because I feel like I should be, but that's what it is. Secondly, most of the invites were done by my wife directly by texting the other kids' families. There were a few kids where my son wanted to invite them, but I didn't have their family's contact info. So we gave him a few sealed envelopes with notes inside saying we understand the boys are friends and that we're having an event for his birthday. And even aside from that, we'd like to set up play dates. From there, the family contacts us and then myself and my wife do the invites after we chat with the family for a bit. My son himself doesn't do the invites. He's a six-year-old. We do the invites through the parents. Not the jerk. And I think you need to escalate this. The only way you'd have been out of line would be if you let him hand out invitations during class time. Ask for a meeting between the school administrator and this teacher. At the beginning of the meeting, apologize for losing your temper and your language, but then go on to politely explain what happened during the phone call and ask the administrator if this is school policy. I'm guessing it's not, and this teacher is way out of line with this request. Administration probably needs to know what she's up to so she doesn't keep trying it with other parents. Chances are she's got a history of crap like this based on her self-righteous attitude. Not the jerk. You declined her request, which was your right to do. Instead of accepting that, she argued with you. She had the opportunity to end the discussion politely, but she chose to keep pursuing it and tried to force the issue. Some people won't take no for an answer until you get more forceful with it. That's on her. 
That said, it's fairly common for teachers to have this sort of rule in their classrooms. Invitations often cannot be passed out in class unless they're going out to everyone. If invitations are being passed out selectively, they should be sent outside of school hours to prevent arguments and hurt feelings. The teacher does have the authority to prevent students from passing out invitations or to set rules on how they're being passed out inside her own classroom. This isn't a new thing. I'm in my 40s and remember having to invite friends to my birthday parties after school because we couldn't pass them out in class unless we were inviting everyone. Like you, my mom had zero interest in having 50 plus people in her house. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the teacher? Please let us know. Sometimes you gotta get a little feisty with people. Am I the jerk for telling my husband to stop inviting his mom to our daughter's performances? Situation is pretty frustrating to say the least, but let's start with some context. So my husband and I have a 13-year-old daughter. She plays piano and has participated in several plays in and outside of school. Now here's the thing. My husband invites his mom to every performance our daughter has. Not saying he shouldn't, but many times she'd put my daughter down and point out where she messed up and what she needed to work on. Hello, she's not even an expert on this. This happens every time. My daughter's picked up on these negative comments and her self-esteem keeps getting lowered and by extension, her performance keeps getting lower as well. I told my husband his mom needs to either stop putting our daughter down or stop coming to her plays. He said his mom is the grandmother and should be included in these events as support. Our daughter had a performance this past Wednesday. I told my husband that his mom can sit this one out, but he said it was too late because he sent her a link to the date and location of the event. I sighed and said nothing. His mom arrived like 20 minutes later, sat next to him and kept pulling him close while whispering in his ear. I just rolled my eyes hard. Once the play was over and after we got a chance to see our daughter, who looked nervous and shaking, Mother-in-law looked at her and said, Let me just say that today's performance was disappointing. My daughter was in shock and I was floored completely. My daughter started crying, then rushed away. Mother-in-law then casually said, Oh, I have to go now. I have an appointment with a salon for Chloe's, her other granddaughter's, birthday party. I was fuming. I told her what she said to my daughter was not okay and that she made her upset. She said something along the line of, Just telling it how it is then left. We went home and I lost it on my husband, telling him his mom just keeps putting our daughter down and it's not right. He said I'm being overdramatic and what his mom is doing is just constructive criticism. I told him from now on he needs to stop inviting her to our daughter's performances. He said I was being ridiculous and that I shouldn't expect his mom to be excluded from her granddaughter's life like that. We had a big argument and now my daughter isn't even interested in playing anymore. My husband said I was way out of line and shouldn't use our daughter in a fight with his mom. He also called me controlling and vicious. Am I the jerk? ETA, since this took off and people are asking more questions, I'd like to add some context in bullet point form. 1. My mother-in-law and I don't talk due to past disagreements. 2. Mother-in-law is uncomfortable with the concept of playing piano and thinks that my daughter is wasting time and getting distracted with zero benefits since she and my husband want her to become a doctor. My daughter doesn't want to be a doctor, but that's an argument for another time. 3. My mother-in-law thinks I'm wasting my husband's money because I enrolled my daughter in piano classes, have been since she was 9. 4. My husband told me he'll keep inviting his mom over and over again until I learn to stop using our daughter as a tool to fight his mom with. Believe me, I'm not. Remove your husband from receiving the information on your daughter's activities. He is the same as his mother. He doesn't see anything wrong because that's how he was raised and I'm willing to bet her other granddaughter she was going to see is the daughter of your husband's golden child sibling. Next time your husband does anything, I mean put a dish in the sink, go into the bathroom, goes out of the car, tell him each time he's doing it wrong and a disappointment. But honestly, I would refuse to be in a marriage where my husband thinks nothing of how his daughter is treated. I would not want my daughter to be around that and at 13, your kid is able to voice who she wants to be around. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. I would really consider a divorce from this man. He clearly is a bad husband and an even worse father. Do whatever you can to get away from both of them because it isn't going to get any better. Am I the jerk for expecting my sister to reimburse me for my son's suit? I, 38 male, am a father to two boys, Andrew who's 14 and Marshall who's 12. Yesterday my parents held an Easter gathering at their house. Me, my parents and my four siblings and their kids were all invited. Marshall told me that he was planning on wearing what he wore to church to my parents' place, a suit and tie. 
My wife and I reminded Marshall that everyone was going to be dressed more casually, but he said he didn't care. I wasn't too surprised because Marshall has always been kind of a sharp dresser. All of my siblings and their kids were there when we arrived, including my sister Sarah, who's 44, who I never really got along with. Her twins, who are both 16, and daughter, who's 14, were also there. Sarah spoils her kids rotten, and they've always been super bratty because of that. Every family gathering, they're always pretty rude to their cousins, and they always act super entitled. Unsurprisingly, Sarah's kids were relentlessly picking on Marshall for choosing to wear a suit when almost everyone else was dressed more casually. I could tell it really bothered Marshall, but he did his best to not let it get to his head. He did his best to ignore them, and he just hung out with Andrew and his cousins that he gets along with. At around 4.30, we all gathered for dinner outside. Sarah's kids kept picking on all of their cousins the whole time, but especially Marshall, because of his choice to wear a suit. Again, he did his best to ignore them, but I still felt really bad. For dessert, my mom made strawberry and chocolate milkshakes for everyone and two large blenders that she had. When everyone there was done, there was still about a half blender of chocolate milkshake and a quarter blender of strawberry. Sarah's kids decided it would be funny to dump them on Marshall and ruin his suit, so that's exactly what they did. Poor Marshall was super embarrassed afterwards and ran away crying. My wife went to go chase him and calm him down. I had enough at that point, so I grabbed Andrew and left. I sent Sarah the dry cleaning bill and told her that I'm expecting her to pay it and that if the dry cleaners can't fix Marshall's suit, then she will have to reimburse me for the suit, along with the dress shirt and tie as well, because she acted like it was no big deal that her kids decided to bully Marshall for no reason. She then told me that she doesn't think she should have to reimburse me and that I'm a terrible father for having my son wear a suit to a casual gathering. I blew up at her, telling her that she has no business in saying how my son should dress and that she needs to learn how to discipline her bratty kids and that she needs to stop spoiling them. I do feel that may have been uncalled for. My parents and all of my other siblings are on my side, believing that Sarah should reimburse me, but they do believe that I should have had Marshall dress more casually. I disagree though, because there's nothing wrong with Marshall wanting to look his best. Am I the jerk? Edit. I'm not going to leave any more comments for now, but thank you all for commenting. I saw a lot of comments saying how I should have directly intervened more and prevented the bullying, which I failed to do so. So my wife and I apologize to Marshall for that. I'm also going to teach Andrew and Marshall how to defend themselves if something like this happens again, as well as stand up for them more. I have also told my parents and all of my other siblings that I will not be attending any more family gatherings if Sarah and her kids are invited. That is, until she pays for the suit and her kids' behaviors improve. I'm also probably going to go no contact with her for a while. Not the jerk. Marshall wasn't dressed inappropriately. It was a family party on a major holiday, not a hike through the Grand Canyon. His cousins ruined his clothes on purpose. It wasn't an accident. They wanted to embarrass him and mess up his clothes. Their parents absolutely should pay to fix the problem, and if they were decent parents, they would make their kids earn back every cent. My neighbor called the cops on my dad and really ended up regretting it. We live in a really quiet neighborhood. The road was never marked, so we used to park on both sides with one lane for cars to pass through. Our relationship with our neighbor was good up until now. He used to come in our yard to ask my father to teach him how to garden. When he goes on vacation, he tells us we can park in his land, which we never did because we have enough room for our cars, but that was nice of him. Until one day, he had a friend come over with a really large truck to help him work on his garden and my father's car was parked in front of our house. The truck could not pass because there was our neighbor's car on the left and ours on the right. The neighbor didn't want to move his car, saying it was on his property, in front of his house on the public paved driveway, and he called us home to move my father's. No one was home except for my 13-year-old brother. He called my father to tell him about the situation, and my father told the neighbor to move his own car as he wasn't home. The neighbor refused and called the cops. They showed up and he explained. The cops were annoyed that they had to show up for this, and they took my father's keys to move his car out of the truck's way. My family was upset, but I was enraged because in my country, it's quite a big deal to call the cops on someone. So I took it upon myself to make it right. I started parking on his side of the road, and he came to me many times to tell me that it's his property. But as it was paved by the state and had plots put there by the city officials, I didn't believe him and I told him to bring me proof that this was his land. He had a survey and came to me one day to show me that this was indeed his property. I said okay and didn't park on his side anymore. However, I called the mayor's office to tell them that I would like the city to pay for plots in front of my house and pave the driveway too as they did for my neighbor. 
turns out, my neighbor had a friend working at the mayor's office and unofficially paved his driveway and put plots in front of his house, not his property, to stop people from parking on his side of the road. It was deemed illegal, and a few days later, the mayor's office sent a guy to take off the plots and the neighborhood had two more public parking spaces. It was petty, but it was worth it. If he had just moved his car, none of this would have happened. No need to say, we no longer have a friendly relationship with him and he's not welcome here anymore. My dad demands my salary. This is a true story. It's about my father. I might sound like a bad person talking about my own parents this way, but it's true. I'm no angel and I've had a rough life. P.S. If you see me talking about money, it's in Indian rupees. One US dollar equals 80 Indian rupees. To be honest, I had a rough childhood. The relationship between me and my father was really bad. I'm the second child and I have an older sister. Apparently, my dad wanted another daughter. Hence, he started avoiding me from the day I was born. Like, he didn't even show up at the hospital that day, so my mom had to go to the hospital alone to give birth to me and come back home with me, the new baby. He avoided me so much that whenever my family would go shopping, everyone would get something with them. A cloth, toffee, or anything they wanted. I, on the other hand, would not have anything. If I asked for something, he would throw a huge tantrum. Let me come clean here. After a few years, after I turned 8 or 9, I did start arguing back. I started to push him to the extremes to make him feel what I felt like, but he would handle it all the same way, yell at me and mistreat me. Even until this day, I have social anxiety disorder because of the experiences I've had. Not only that, he loved throwing away my stuff. When I was young, I had a hobby of collecting things. My oldest memory is of me collecting shells from the beach. He would throw everything away, saying that it was worthless. I started collecting stamps, and he used all of them to send letters to his friends. I started collecting coins, and he threw them all in the toilet. I collected fossils. Not lying, I had fossils. He waited until I filled a full bucket of amber and other kinds of fossils and sent a verification to the archaeologist department to verify it. They verified it and said that they are original and could get me thousands if I sell them. I didn't want to sell and wanted to collect more. Days later, he took all of it and threw it away because, and I quote, carrying bones inside the house would bring demons inside. I gave up fighting him at that point. I was around 13 to 15 at the time. I thought that if I could bear a few more years, I could get my own life with my own rules. When the time came for me to go to college, he wouldn't let me choose my favorite course. I was forced to choose IT. Not regretting that, but it wasn't my thing. I just agreed and lived in the hostel. He went abroad for work after that. I thought I could live my life after that, but he doesn't let go of me that easily. He gave his number to like everyone in my college, my classmates, roommates, professor, etc., and he'd investigate me every day. If I don't respond the way he liked, he'd send my sister, family favorite, to get my mobile phone and make me realize what it's like to be lonely. After four hard years and one year of training, I got a nice job and an MCN that I've always looked up to. In January of this year, I got my first salary. I wanted to have a lot of fun with it, like having good food in a nice restaurant with my friends, going out on a hiking trip, etc. That's when he shows up again, after all these years, giving me everything I wanted. He'd have my food on the plate before I got to the table. The water heater would be on hours before I went to the bathroom for a shower, things like that. My mother, being the kind-hearted angel she is, warns me that he's doing it to get my money and nothing else. And just like she said, a few days later, my dad comes to me and demands that I send him 3,000 rupees. Like I said before, I was still a trainee. My salary was hardly above 5,000, so I straight up refused to pay him that much. He was working abroad, so I was sure he already had millions in his account and just didn't want to spend his own money. Then the blackmailing starts. My grandma, sister, uncles, and everyone in my family insisted on me paying my dad because family comes first. So after a lot of arguments, I decided to take the hard way around. I pay him the 3000 pack my stuff, and move out. I remove my dad's name from the nominee and insurance list that my company provides, free healthcare in all major hospitals throughout the world for the employees and three family members, which just has my mother's name now. Now I live alone, just a few minutes away from the main headquarters of my company. The story doesn't end there. He called me a few days ago asking me for another 10000 This time he says no matter how much I get in my salary, I should send him 10000 every month. If you're living with your expenses, you know that's impossible. 
To put that into contrast, I make around $25,000 a month. The room I live in costs $14,500 per month in rent. Also, there are internet costs, food, tax, and other essentials that I need to take care of. So I just decide to ignore him a few days. I've made up my mind. I'm not paying him a penny after this. Even if it means that the money would save his life, I won't do it. I've suffered a lot, but that doesn't mean I'm going to help my oppressors and be a good hero. Everyone should own up and pay for what they're worth. So yes, the money is mine. I'm saving the rest of my money, salary minus expenses, up for my future wife, marriage, and kids. A crazy mom screams at me for not helping out in the ER. Hi, I'm a 28-year-old doctor and my specialty is in clinical chemistry and laboratory medicine, so I usually do not interact with patients much anymore. This happened during my specialization training and it still makes me shake my head. My colleague and friend in another department suddenly developed seizures in the middle of the night. Her husband contacted me as I often helped her before they were married and I was taking a midnight stroll in the campus as I was on call for the lab. I went to emergency and got all her papers ready. My junior from my alma mater was studying emergency medicine and she helped expedite things. My friend arrived the same time another family involved in an accident arrived. Since my friend was still seizing, my junior asked if I could place an IV for the time being because they needed to look at the family involved in the accident while the neurologist arrived. No problem. The ED was extremely busy and I was ready to help. I did everything for my friend as one of the nursing officers handed me the anti-epileptic drug while her husband, also a doctor but in another hospital, stayed by to make sure she was comfortable. That was when Entitled Mother tapped on my shoulder. Hi, can you help me? Me. Hi, sorry, I'm not an ED doctor, but I can guide you to who you should see. Aren't you a doctor? Me. Um, yes, but I'm not part of the ED. I'm here for my friend. So, since you helped your friend, can you take a look at my kid? Me. I'm so sorry, but I cannot. I cannot take responsibility as I'm not part of the emergency team and neither am I posted here. When my friend in the ED gets better, I shall ask her to take a look. But you helped your friend? Me. Yes, because the team is busy with an accident and since it's my friend, all I did was set an IV so that she'll be stable till they can come back and check on her. So, why can't you help me? I'm tired of waiting and my kid is uncomfortable. Me, tired now. Lady, I'm not an emergency doctor, nor am I on duty. I cannot help you or take responsibility should something happen. Please wait for the emergency doctor to be free. Why don't you go to the registration counter? They will ensure someone looks after you. I cannot leave my kid alone. Why can't you take a look at him? Me, sighing. Where is your kid now and what is wrong? I cannot give any advice or do anything because I'm not part of the posted emergency team, but I can inform them. I need you to look at him. He fell down and he's crying. Me. Just wait. Once an emergency doctor comes, I will send them your way. Now she's grabbing my arm. You will see him now. Friend's hubby, pulling me away and blocking her. You will leave her alone. She's not part of the emergency team. Stop harassing her. Karen. Help. Help. They are assaulting me. A charge nurse finally ran in asking what was wrong. I knew her as we were part of the same prayer group, so she asked my side first. I explained about my friend and how entitled mom was forcing me to help her son when I can't. Charge nurse. OP is a doctor, but she's not posted nor a part of our emergency team. We needed her to help her friend because we're super busy, but that's it. She can't help you. Karen. Stop giving excuses. You just don't want to help me. You. Me. Now. Help me with my son or I will complain. Me, now annoyed. Go ahead. I turned away as Karen was dealing with the charge nurse as the neurologist had arrived and I had to talk with her and friend's hubby. I thought that was it. Wrong. As my friend got better and I was helping another charge nurse with the IV bag while she gave my friend another dose of anti-epileptic drug, my hand was suddenly pulled, nearly causing me to pull out the IV. Karen had grabbed me. Me, now really angry. What on earth? You again? What are you doing? You nearly made me rip off this IV. Karen. This is the doctor who refused to help me. I want her license cancelled. Turns out she had dragged the emergency medical officer, the senior doctor watching over everything, to complain. The officer blinked as she knew I did not work in the ER unless I was posted there, which I was not. Officer. She does not work here. Karen. Yes, she does. She was fixing that woman's IV. Officer, she's part of the hospital, but she does not work in the ED. 
Since she is a doctor, she was just helping her friend, but that's it. She can't look after your kid unless I tell her to. Stop lying. Why are you covering for her? She is the worst. Friends hubby. Officer, take this lady away. My wife is not well, and she's been harassing OP too much. OP is already going out of her way to be polite. Officer agreed and turned to Karen. Officer, I saw your kid. He's fine. We are swamped today, especially since we had an entire family be admitted here. If you continue to create ruckus, we will ask you to leave and maybe even ban you. Karen, but I did nothing wrong. It's her fault. Officer, firmly, you have two options. You either leave them alone or you leave. Karen left us as she grumbled and I heaved a sigh of relief. My friend had recovered, so we decided to have her discharged and have her checked up on in the morning. As we were leaving, we saw Karen glare at us and mouth words at us, but we ignored her. Friend's hubby apologized, but I told him not to worry as none of it was his fault. Next morning, the story had spread in the whole hospital and my guide told me to be firm and not entertain people who were like Karen. It's not very exciting, but it's not the first time I went through this. Since I have friends in the ED, I often go to see them and be treated so badly by patients and their relatives. Some days I'm glad I'm in the laboratory medicine and not in the emergency department. Sorry for the long post, but I was talking to my friend and we spoke about this incident and I thought to share it. Grocery store nonsense. This happened a few years back. I worked for a large grocery chain for 12 years. In that time, I worked all holidays, came in early, stayed late, rarely called out sick, and came in on my days off. I was treated like crap near the tail end of my time there when we had gotten a new co-manager at the store. He acted like I wasn't a team player. He stalked my Facebook if I called out sick, trying to catch me in a lie, since he was used to me coming in and working when I was sick most of the time, which I know is completely terrible in and of itself. In those rare occasions that I would call out, he tried to require me to have a doctor's note to excuse the one day I would miss. All while this is happening, people would come in late, be no call, no shows, and be out sick for weeks with management knowing full well that these people would be on vacation. All this with zero disciplinary action. Cue malicious compliance number one. The store started cracking down hard on overtime, so they were used to me coming in early and staying late to make sure all tasks were completed with no complaints from management since it meant that it freed up other people, themselves included, from having to do the work. My department, which was just me, was constantly praised by corporate as being the best looking and cared for department they have seen in the entire Northwest. I took pride in my job and what I did, but this soon became me working just my scheduled hours. It resulted in incorrect orders, a fall behind in keeping the shelf stocked, and a massive amount of overstock adding up in the back room. People that were clueless as to what we had in the back room were tasked with fulfilling my orders and ordering things they thought we needed, but did not. It quickly became a crap show. They started letting me come in whenever I wanted and staying as long as necessary after about a month of fall behind. Cue malicious compliance number two. I was really tired of being treated so poorly for the amount of time and effort I put into making my department perfect. I applied at a company that my friend had been trying to get me to come to for at least five years. Wasn't expecting to get the job as I had very little experience in that company since most of my working career was at a grocery store. But I figured, hey, the worst that would happen is I wouldn't get it and still have a full-time job with my current employer. Well, they absolutely loved me and quickly hired me on full-time. I put in a notice at the store that I had accepted a job elsewhere but was willing to stay there part-time to train whomever they hired to take my spot. Five months go by and they hadn't even posted my position. They did nothing to fill my place. I ended up putting my two-week notice in as I was so burned out working 60 plus hours a week with my two jobs with no scheduled days off between the two. I made sure that I was available to the grocery store for a huge holiday and my last day would be the day after. This lovely co-manager, mentioned earlier, thought he was hurting me by not scheduling me for the last week of my notice which this holiday fell in. Other management tried to backtrack this and try to get me to come in anyway. But alas, the schedule had been posted. And as per union guidelines, they could not change your schedule once posted without consent from the employee. I shrugged at the co-manager and said, Sorry, I wasn't on the schedule, so I made plans with my family since I hadn't had this holiday off for years. The rest of management was furious at this guy for trying to pull this power move which blew up in his face. I cashed out my banked vacation time before leaving, which only capped out at three weeks pay. But still, 
it was my final forget you. I hear from old friends and colleagues that this co-manager was demoted to a clerk in a small department. I work now for a far superior company who values their employees and compensates hard work. I had taken a huge pay cut when I took on this new position, but within three years, I was making more than I had been making in 12 years at the grocery store. Biannual bonuses, paid vacation, a massive amount of paid sick and vacation time, and a considerable amount of less stress. I almost got a Karen arrested. So, I worked at Panda Express my senior year and didn't turn 18 until a few months after graduating high school, but my parents allowed me more freedom than most in my circumstance. However, I have a lot of fun stories from this time frame, but this was my absolute favorite. There was a Target next to where I worked, and I often stopped by to pick up snacks or sodas before work. Because my work shirt was red, I often got mistaken for a Target employee, but nothing like this. One particular summer day, I went to Target while on break to buy a new water bottle, as I had accidentally broken mine during my shift and wanted to get it replaced. Corporate was really stingy and deducted money from our checks if we used the cups at work. And it was hot outside, so it was better to get a cheap replacement and a snack while on break. While I was wandering the store with plenty of time to spare, I noticed someone was following me. At first, I thought it was a coincidence, but after the fifth detour aisle, I realized she was following me. Being only 17, I was actually a bit nervous and finally mustered up the courage to face her. Me. Can I help you with something? Karen. It's about time. I've been trying to get your attention for forever now. I often wore headphones as I had severe social anxiety and didn't like being in public areas that were crowded like this. Me. Well, can I help you? Karen. Is that how you treat your customers? Talk about poor customer service. I was genuinely confused until I realized that she, like so many people before her, had confused me for a target worker, despite the fact that I had a giant panda on the back of my shirt along with the company name. These types of encounters were normally pretty easy, but this lady wasn't having it. Me. Ma'am, I don't work here. Karen. Don't go lying to me like that. How dumb do you think I am? At this point, we had attracted the attention of a few employees who called for their supervisor, S. As I tried to reason with this lady, the supervisor showed up and took over the conversation. Supervisor, is there a problem here? Karen, this employee is walking around and ignoring customers. She was extremely rude to me and I want her fired. Supervisor looks at me and sees the Panda Express logo on my shirt. Ma'am, she doesn't work here. Karen, are you calling me stupid? At this point, she starts towards me and I backed away trying to hide behind the supervisor while struggling to understand what her problem was. She reached around the supervisor and grabbed a fistful of my shirt before either of us were able to react. She tugged so hard at my shirt that it almost slipped over my head and I started crying at this point. Karen, see, she's wearing a red shirt, so she must be an employee here. I want her fired. Me, let go of me, please. Thankfully, one of my mom's friends happened to be shopping that day with her kids and saw this lady holding me by the shirt. She immediately walked up to the lady with her kids, one of whom was my age, in tow, and proceeded to grab Karen by her arm. My mom's friend, what on earth do you think you're doing? Get your hands off her now. Karen pauses for a moment and looks from me to the woman and back again. She's not a kid, she's a young adult. Me, still trying to get free. I'm 17, lady, and for the last time, I don't work here. At this point, you could hear a pin drop from across the room, and I thought Karen was going to just let go and leave me alone. However, she huffed and looked away, commented how being 17 practically made me an adult and was no excuse to act so rudely. My mom's friend, the employees, and the supervisor had enough by this point and were already calling the police, while my friend, who had seen me bullied all throughout high school, attempted to call me down. My mom's friend wanted to know where my mom was, to which I replied that she was likely at home since I had been working. Then I explained that I had to come to buy a new water bottle after breaking mine. My mom's friend actually paid for my water bottle and told me to go back to work so that I didn't get into trouble, but she also warned me that the police might be coming by to talk to me. I didn't think anything of this and did exactly as she said, knowing that I was never going to hear the end of it from my mom when I got home that night. As my mom's friend warned, the police showed up at work later that day and asked a few questions and my boss didn't seem to mind as I explained what happened as soon as I got back. I never heard what happened to Karen, but my mom told me to never let anyone grab me like that again 
as they could be arrested for doing that. Am I the jerk for humiliating my husband in front of his co-workers when he implied that I wasn't as beautiful as the boss's wife? My husband recently got a new job at a private practice working for a cosmetic surgeon. He works on the business slash financial end of the practice. The boss's wife is genuinely one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I do struggle with my self-esteem, so I will admit there were times I didn't want to be around her. I know that this is my issue and she has never been unkind to me, so it is something I was willing to work through because my husband is very ambitious and networking is important to him. I've noticed the men he works with talk a lot about the boss's beautiful wife when the boss isn't around, and I think it's kind of gross the way they do this. Recently, we got invited to her 40th birthday, and two of his co-workers were at our house and making a big deal about how they didn't know that she was 40. She doesn't look 40. This was right in front of their wives, one of whom was pregnant. At this point, I just feel bad for the women, because all of their wives hate her and talk so much crap about her when she hasn't even done anything, just because these guys are gross. Someone asked my husband if he knew she was 40. My husband said, I mean, yeah, because she graduated med school and has been practicing for like 10 years. I'm not surprised. But Kim Kardashian is also 40, so it is doable. But she is married to a plastic surgeon. Of course she is going to be the most beautiful woman in the world. I was in shock that he called her the most beautiful woman in the world. Of course I don't actually think I am, but isn't he supposed to think that? I clapped back that she really is gorgeous and who knows what I would look like if he gave me half the lifestyle her husband gives her. My husband immediately got quiet and tried to laugh it off, but I knew I heard him. He is very driven by money, and though he makes good money, he compares himself to guys who make more, and his boss is loaded. When they left, he asked me how I could humiliate him like that, and said I let my insecurities get the best of me. Everyone sucks here. You all sound very superficial. This poor woman does nothing but exist and all of you talk bad about her because of your unhappy marriages. Grown people standing around talking about someone's looks like you're in an episode of some 2000s teen sitcom where the parents are the annoying B-plot you want to fast forward through. Everyone sucks here. You think that you're above it because you recognize that she hasn't done anything, but you're happy to use her and her husband as pawns in some petty little back and forth with your husband. Leave them out of your bickering. Everyone sucks here. You honestly both have insecurities to work on. He's not the most successful man in the world and you're not the most beautiful. This is true for the vast majority of people on earth and it's fine. There's no reason to be that upset about it. Am I the jerk for refusing to move countries? My daughter moved to the US from Canada. Both my husband and I are in Canada and we're working and live here our whole lives. My daughter left to be with her boyfriend who she married and recently divorced. The father has left for his home country and it's almost impossible to get him to pay child support now. She's going through a lawyer, but it will likely take years, and he doesn't have a job now, so she probably won't get much from him. Now she's a single mother with two kids, and childcare costs around $1,400 a month, making her $3,700 a month income not enough to support them. She wants me to move to Texas to look after her sons for her. I don't have any interest in moving to the US, and told her to come back to Ontario and she could move in with us and we can help her with her kids. Ontario also has affordable $10 a day childcare subsidy, though I'm not 100% sure if she would qualify. She refuses because she found a new boyfriend and wants to continue to live with him. I told her I'm not moving down there and she can move up here. She has dual citizenship and we can help her or she can stay in Texas. She then tried asking for $1,400 every month to cover her childcare, which I told her I don't have and she argued since her children are my grandsons, I need to help provide for them. I told her I will let her stay rent free and help her babysit if she moves back, and she insists I have to move there or pay for her daycare costs because she wants to be with her new boyfriend. I was so annoyed she would stay for a man who she's only known for a few months and told her to ask him for the money since she's staying in Texas for him and she yelled that I was being heartless. Help me! Okay, here's some help. No, not like that. Help me by completely uprooting your life. Not the jerk. I suspect that your daughter is emotionally distressed at the moment and is not able to hear your side very well. However, her inability to accept your help does not mean that you are a jerk. The daughter sounds delusional. She's an adult. She cannot pay her bills but doesn't want to be inconvenienced in any way. Instead, she wants the world to bend around her. 
Who in their right mind demands that their parents uproot their entire lives for the sole purpose of providing free childcare or give them large amounts of money each month? OP has been more than generous by offering to help with the daughter if she moves back, but she's more concerned about her new boyfriend. What happens if OP moves and the daughter finds a new boyfriend that she wants to run off to? Am I the jerk for not telling my parents about my little brother's school play and going myself instead? Ever since my mom decided she was tired of being a stay-at-home mom and got a job last year, along with my dad already working almost the entire day, I, male 24, have been taking care of my little brother, who's seven, most of the day. I buy his clothes, school supplies, food, and cook for him. My parents give me the money, of course. I usually tell my parents about how my brother is doing in school and what happened in the day, but last week I decided to omit that he was going to participate in a school play this Monday, yesterday. I didn't tell them because not only could just one relative per kid attend, but my brother also specifically told me he'd wanted me there. They could have gotten out of work early for it, but I didn't want them there to be honest. While they didn't even know he had an act coming, I helped him rehearse, learn his lines, and even paid for his costume. I just don't think either of them deserve to be present. My brother takes his sweet time to change when he gets home, so he still had the costume while my mom came home from work. She asked me why he was dressed in a suit, he played a butler, and I told her it was his costume for the school play. She told me she doesn't remember any school play, and I said that I indeed didn't tell her or my dad about it. She got mad and said I have no right to hide stuff from her when it concerns her son, and that I was breaking the agreement we had. I told her she and dad didn't deserve to watch it, sent her the recording of the play I made and went to my room. Today, they both have been acting cold, and I'm kind of regretting I didn't tell them before, since I'm all the time with my brother and I could have spared a day for my mom and dad and all of that stuff. Not the jerk. They neglected their parental duties and loaded them off onto you. Your brother wanted you there, not your parents, and maybe if they were asking him about his school day instead of you, they would have known about it. Am I the jerk for telling my daughter that she's getting what she deserves? I, 58, male, have two daughters. One from a previous marriage and another from my wife's previous marriage. Both daughters are around the same age. Think mid-twenties. My daughter Allie has never gotten along with her stepsister Joanna. If Joanna invited Allie to a movie, Allie was suddenly super busy and had no time. If Joanna wanted to come with Allie to a party, Joanna wasn't invited and there was no way she could bring her. She'd rip up Joanna's things and would blame Joanna when she'd be grounded. Just the run-of-the-mill petty teenager BS. Joanna was a good sport and always seemed to take things on the chin. Her explanation was always that sisters fight. Until about maybe three or four summers ago, Allie was home from college and was going through a rough breakup that was causing her grades to tank, which put her on academic probation. Allie was upset and was taking it out on everyone, especially Joanna. My wife and I told her to cut it out and she seemed to catch on that her behavior wasn't going to be accepted. Come to find out, after Allie leaves to go back to college, that she had completely destroyed Joanna's scrapbook with pictures of her dad and destroyed a lot of the shirts she had left of his. Joanna didn't make a stink about it in front of us, but that night the house stunk of E6000 and Mod Podge. You could guess what she spent the night doing. After that incident, Joanna had completely given up on Allie. Allie has a birthday coming up. Joanna wouldn't even sign the card. Allie is in town for the weekend. Unless it's a holiday or a family event, Joanna wasn't there. And honestly, we didn't blame her. Now the issue is that Allie wants Joanna to let things go and let bygones be bygones. Joanna is getting married soon and Allie wants an invite. It was brought up this past week at a family dinner. Joanna and her fiancé as well as their son attended. Allie brought up how the kids were the same age and how it would be cool after the wedding if the kids could hang out. Allie has also asked what she should wear to Joanna's wedding and if she'd be a bridesmaid. Joanna pretty much laid it out for Allie that she wasn't coming and that the kids wouldn't be seeing each other outside of family events. The night was pretty tense afterwards and I asked Joanna if there was any way she would forgive Allie. She said she wanted nothing to do with her and I told her I fully understand that she carries a lot of hurt from how Allie treated her. Allie came to me after Joanna left and pretty much begged me to convince Joanna to move past things. I told her that had she been a more considerate and kind person back then, that maybe she'd have a chance at a relationship with her stepsister. I told her that she made her bed and she needs to lay in it. She said I'm a jerk and that any good father would want to see his kids reunite. Am I the jerk for telling her she deserves this? 
My pregnant sister expects me to support her family financially. My sister got pregnant with her boyfriend right out of high school, got married the next year, then proceeded to pop out another baby every year or two. So she now has four kids and she's 24 years old. She's a stay-at-home mom, even though she was brilliant and could have gotten a free ride to a great university. Since hers are the only grandkids, our parents fawn over her constantly. They gush over every new tooth or haircut like it's some sort of huge achievement. Problem is, her husband's business wasn't doing great even before lockdown and is barely limping along now. Sister doesn't work and my parents have limited income. So guess who constantly gets told to lend money to them for crap like school fees, car seats, car payments, new strollers, etc. They don't even ask. My mom just texts me, your sister needs money for the kids and I'm supposed to cough it up. If I complain, they accuse me of being jealous because I don't have a husband and family even though I'm older. I'm only 26. So over Easter, I notice my sister isn't drinking and I think, oh no, here we go again. Sure enough, she stands up and announces that she's having yet another precious miracle. Everyone's gushing and I just try to stay quiet and out of the way. Later, she asks me if everything is alright and I try to play it off, but she pushes so I asked her if she and her husband could really afford another baby. Very snippily, she replies, God will provide like he has so far, which really ticked me off. I yelled that, no, actually God didn't provide for her babies. I did, and I wasn't going to be giving them any more handouts. It devolved into a huge argument and everyone shouted at me. And basically, I've been banned from my family unless I apologize. I haven't apologized. It's been a radio silence except for one text from my mom saying that if my sister has issues with her pregnancy, then it's my fault for stressing her out. I asked if my sister was showing any symptoms, but no one will answer me or tell me. I don't know. I don't think I'm the jerk, but I don't want to be the reason that she has pregnancy issues. Not the jerk. And the next time your mom says, oh, your sister needs money and you need to give it to them, just say, no. Sister said God will provide, so I'm giving him a turn. That and or... Sorry, I'm banned from the family. Guess it's up to you. A good shiny spine is what's really needed here. If they choose to exclude you from the family for a very reasonable boundary, you will not give any money for any reason now or ever in the future, then it's their loss. Feel free to remind them that you're a family member, not an ATM, and they are the ones who have chosen to exclude. The door is open if they want a relationship, but the financial door will have to stay closed and they can take it or leave it. Also, feel free to remind them that they will have to look to your sister when they are old and need assistance if they don't treat you well now. You're not the jerk or an ATM. You don't owe anyone an apology. But if you want to keep the peace, you could say something like this. I'm sorry that I didn't react well to your news. It is your decision how to grow your family and live your life. And if you're happy, then I'm happy for you. But I want to make sure that you understand that I can no longer provide you with financial support. I feel like you've been taking advantage of my generosity. If the only way to get your forgiveness or to have a place in this family is to pay for it by supporting your kids financially, then I guess we all need to take some time apart. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. I just heard the Mario coin sound. I think you have a notification on your phone, Reddit boy. But yeah, that sister is the jerk. There's nothing worse than people who pop out babies and expect others to pay for them. Hi, I'd like a free taco. I work at a taco shop, not Taco Bell, known for its little hash brown circles instead of fries. But another thing we're known for is Taco Tuesday. Yesterday was that lovely day. My boss loves to schedule me for all the rushes. The first time we met, he decided he loved me taking orders and I would not do anything else. We're working with a skeleton crew, but we function astonishingly well. The boss owns a few different locations and he'll often come in and talk to us about how there's one specific person on drive through just for making drinks. I'm normally the one on the drive through taking orders and dealing with everything at the window, plus anything else I'm tasked with taking care of that day. Like I said, skeleton crew. We're often picking up each other's slack. Anyway, for lunch rush, I spent two hours doing nothing but taking orders, so I knew when I came back for dinner it would only get worse. If I only knew. It was a boring Taco Tuesday, busy as any other and just as many frustrating customers, until we had the local high school drop in. Now, normally one of two people makes the schedule, Big Boss Man or Awesome Boss Man. For reasons I'm not going to get into, Awesome Boss wasn't available to make the schedule the last few weeks, 
and he's the one that normally keeps an eye on the school sporting events. Our store is the only one in the area open past 7 to 8, so when a sports event happens, everyone comes here and Awesome Boss tries to schedule extra people for it. That did not happen this week. Instead, Big Boss made the schedule and decided I'm good enough. I was not good enough. It was a Taco Tuesday, and some sport had just ended, and the boys seemed to have won by the way they were celebrating, carelessly spilling food everywhere and hanging out just everywhere that they could inside, leaving me giant messes to clean. It took me 20 minutes to just take the orders. No, like I've told everyone else in front of you, we don't have fries. Yes, asking if we have Whoppers is so hilarious after the first few guys. It was looking to be your normal group of high school boys, and I just let them be. I had been running back and forth, also taking my drive orders and dealing with those orders. I didn't have enough energy to chit-chat with my regulars for a second. Finally, finally I get through the group of boys and their coaches, and I'm happy to finally finish customers serving for a moment. Just as I'm about to take a moment to breathe in some air that doesn't smell like sweat or Axe body spray, in walks, I'm going to call him annoying customer. Now sure, I've had Karens and the such come in before. I know how to keep my cool and handle those people. This man would show me I still have a long way to go. Me. Hi, welcome to Taco Place. What can we get started for you? Jerk. Is it Taco Tuesday? Me. Yeah, it is but we recently upped the price a few extra pennies. That's fine. I want three. No cheese. Everything else. Me. Okay. That'll be... I don't know. It was like six dollars. But it's Taco Tuesday. Me. Yes, sir. But the extra stuff costs a little extra, and then there's another dollar worth of tax. No, 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 no. I don't want anything extra. Just no cheese, but extra lettuce and beef. Me. Okay. That's still this price. Jerk. No, 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 no. You're not understanding me. I don't want any cheese. And instead of cheese, I want extra beef and lettuce. Now, I've spent all day bending over backwards to help my coworker and satisfy customers best I can. But I'd been yelled at. This man lost all chances he had at getting any help. I understood he meant he wanted extra beef and lettuce in place of the cheese. But even when I substituted out, those things cost extra. So I take off the extra. Give him his new total of three something and away he goes, at this point probably thinking he's won. I simply duck into the kitchen. Hey Rose! Rose is our current night manager, and when Big Boss and Awesome Boss aren't there, she's in control. Rose had just seen the order come up on her screen, and I could see the three taco shells waiting to be made into tacos. She knew what was coming since our kitchen was right behind the front register. She had seen me get yelled at. She had seen me almost fall apart trying to handle the giant rush of people by myself before him, and she knew I already had a plan in mind. Give him as little of everything as you can without getting in trouble. She nods, and I watch as the tiniest scoop of beef is set on this taco and only seven shreds of lettuce sit on top. Honestly, I don't like handing out these types of tacos because I'm like, the customer paid for a taco, we should give them a taco, but not with this man. I felt he was lucky with how much he was getting. I give him his three tacos. I'm expecting him to return to our counter with a complaint in a minute, tops, and I'm surprised as I watch him happily enjoy said tacos. Maybe this plan wasn't as satisfying as I'd hoped. He throws away his trash, and I keep him in the corner of my eye as I do some minor restocking. Then he's back at the counter. Either he's going to complain, or he's going to order more food. Either way, I see an opportunity fall into my lap. Me. Hi, is everything okay? Jerk. Yes, I ordered extra stuff on my tacos, and they didn't have the extra. Me. Oh, I'm so sorry about that, sir. We can remake those for you if you've got your receipt. I threw it away. Me. That's a shame, but we really can't do anything without the receipt. The boss gets mad if we give out free food for no reason. He's obviously not happy as he goes digging through the trash for said receipt. He returns and places it in front of me. I look it over, knowing exactly what I'll see but I still wanted to waste a few seconds of his day. Me. I'm sorry, sir, but according to your receipt, you didn't ask for anything extra. Jerk. Yes, I did. I asked three times. Me. And you yelled at me for how expensive that made your order, so we didn't charge you for them. Because they weren't on the order, the kitchen didn't put them on there. You seemed satisfied with that. Jerk. Then I want a free taco since you messed up my order. At this point, Rose stuck her head out of the kitchen and promptly told him, I'm not making you a free taco. 
You've yelled at my staff for simply doing their job, and you got exactly what you paid for, so I'm going to have to ask you to leave if you keep causing trouble. He made some stink about calling the boss, but we didn't hear anything that night and I haven't gone in for my next shift, but I doubt anything will actually happen. If there was a problem with the tacos, why did he eat all the tacos? He was enjoying eating the tacos because he intended to go back up and complain to get more free tacos. He enjoyed them all the more with the knowledge of his perfect plan in place. Don't mess with my overtime. Many years ago, I worked as an engineer repairing retail customers' PCs. Our team was small and there was often times when the amount of PCs needing repair was more than the team could get through during normal hours. In these circumstances, we were allowed voluntary overtime on Saturday and would get time and a half for it. The rule for the overtime was flexible. We could start when we wanted and finish when we wanted and would get paid for each full 60 minutes we were clocked in for. Back then, my girlfriend, now wife, used to work until 2 p.m. on a Saturday, so I would go in for 9.30 a.m. and leave at 1.30 p.m., giving me plenty of time to pick her up. This worked out great for everyone. However, the company structure was a little strange, with the front-facing customer service under the management of one director and the back of house, including my team, under the management of another, and they despised each other, constantly trying to cause each other problems. And of course, the workers were always caught in the middle. One fateful Saturday, I was working and noticed the front-facing director walk up, see that I was there, and move on without saying anything. I didn't think anything of it, and a short while later left at 1.30 as normal. I got in as normal on Monday to find I had a meeting request from my director. Confused, I attended the meeting and I found both my director and the front director also there. Turns out the front director had arranged for a customer to bring in their PC for an urgent repair on Saturday, having confirmed I was there to fix it. On the spot repairs were very rare, reserved for only the most problematic or highest spending customers. Me not being there to look at it had caused the customer to have a meltdown in the shop in front of many other customers. Of course, the front director took the opportunity to bring this up with the MD to get one up on my director, leading to the Monday meeting where she was out for my blood. Luckily, as the overtime rules for our department were clear and I followed them, there was no direct action taken against me, with my director supporting me. However, one thing that did come from this was that we lost our flexible overtime. From that point on, if we wanted to do overtime on a Saturday, we must be there for the whole day. As I wasn't willing to lose my entire Saturday, overtime stopped. It took less than a month for the department's backlog to hit over 100 units. Our target was to have less than 15 at the end of each day. I'd originally wondered why my director didn't put up a fight when the new rule was set, but it didn't take long to see the number of customer service complaints and call waiting times skyrocket, all of which was the front director's responsibility. Not long after, my director approached me smiling to let me know that the front director had gone to the MD first to try to force us to do overtime and when that failed, beg for the new rule to be removed. So the next Saturday, I was back earning a little extra cash and that director didn't try to mess around with our hours again. Sometimes you just gotta let them fall on their faces. Your director apparently knew this. Good on them. When your enemy is making a mistake, don't interrupt them. Am I the jerk for not helping my pregnant roommate with everything? I live in the dorms and got a new roommate this semester because my old one went home. I had never met her before she moved in. She's currently six months pregnant and wants me to do more for her than I want to. We aren't friends, but because we share a room, she says I should support her more. After she moved in, I noticed the food from my little fridge that I brought from home kept going missing. I confronted her and she admitted she ate it but said it wasn't her fault because she was hungry. I got a lock for the fridge and she's been really cold ever since. Then she got mad because I had a bad day one day last week, so my boyfriend came over. During the hours, we can have visitors in the dorms to watch TV and gave me a back rub, and she kept talking loudly about how she needs a massage. After he left, she tried to tell me I needed to give her a massage and rub her feet because she's hurting, but I refused because we aren't close enough for me to want to do that. Then she tried to tell me I can't have him over, but I don't see why she gets to set the rules. Then over the weekend, she wanted me to get food for her when I was studying and was mad when I told her to do DoorDash or something. Last night, she woke me up because she was having food cravings and wanted me to drive to the store. The only one open at that hour is about 30 minutes away. 
I refused, and she's been complaining all day about how I'm a jerk for not supporting her. Am I the jerk for not doing stuff for her? Not the jerk. Can you talk to the housing department at school and see if you can get a room change? She's using pregnancy as an excuse to be extra needy. Something tells me she's needy even when not pregnant. I wish I had a magic answer for you. Good luck. I'm currently pregnant, and OP's roommate is the type of pregnant person that I loathe. Believe it or not, other people should not be expected to drop everything in their lives to accommodate a pregnant person. If you want to give up your seat on the bus, that's actually nice. But to get your food eaten or be demanded to go get food for her cravings? Nah, get out of here. Especially people in OP's position. OP isn't the father. OP isn't even a friend that might be able to help from time to time. Roommate needs a reality check for when the baby is born. Not the jerk. Edit. I'm currently carrying twins and understand health concerns that fellow pregnant people have. I'm also not saying to completely forget basic manners and kindness towards those who are pregnant. Goodness, I'm not that horrible. I also don't want roommate to suffer. My post is strictly on those who continue to push boundaries and act entitled. Not the jerk, but roommate is. She got herself pregnant and now she can't take care of herself. You're not friends, but basically strangers sharing a room. You owe her nothing. Her demands are ridiculous and she's using her pregnancy as an excuse for everything. If you have an RA, I'd talk to them about her rules, demands, and inconveniences. It's above and beyond what a dorm roommate should have to do to survive. OP. We already talked to the RA. We had a meeting and tried to set boundaries. She wanted no guests, no locks on the fridge, no coming in late, and me doing all the cleaning, and I help her with more stuff. I wanted no taking my food, no getting up and turning the light on when I'm asleep. She does this all the time and it wakes me up. Shared cleaning and to be left alone. The RA told her to stop taking my food and that I can keep the lock on the fridge, but we didn't come to an agreement on any rules. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her roommate? Please let us know. No wonder baby daddy ain't around. That poor baby's gonna grow up being raised by a Karen. Am I the jerk for kicking my girlfriend out after an argument? So adoption is pretty common in my family. I probably have more adopted cousins than biological ones, though I can't say for sure since it really doesn't matter in my family. I'm 22, male, and my younger brother, who's 15, was adopted by my parents when he was 7. Our dads were close, and he used to come around a lot. His parents split when he was about 5, and his mom ended up in jail a few months later. His dad then passed due to medical issues when he was 7, and my parents took him in because he would have gone into the system. So he's lived with us since I was 14, and I do see him as my little brother, and we are family. His biological mom is still around, but isn't allowed to see him. The problem comes in with my girlfriend. We've been together for two years and we've met each other's family and we have gotten along great with them. About a month ago, she came to me complaining about how her sister is adopting, saying it was cheating, especially since she doesn't have any fertility issues. I told her that it doesn't matter if the kid is adopted or not and that my brother is adopted. She didn't say anything else to me about it after that. However, she has stopped calling my brother, my brother. She just calls him by his name now. Yesterday, she and her friend, who is also my friend and introduced us, were talking about how she is so happy that my parents will be her in-laws. He agreed and said that my parents and my brother would make great in-laws. She then corrected him and told him that my brother wouldn't be her in-law since he's adopted. He had no idea how to respond and ended up telling me about it. This caused an argument between us with me saying my brother is my brother and her insisting that he isn't and that there's a difference. She told me to sleep somewhere else that night. I told her, no, this is my home too, and if she has the issue, she should sleep somewhere else. This caused her to scream at me, calling manipulative and horrible before leaving to sleep at her parents. Her dad, who I really get along with, has asked to speak with me, and I've gotten some aggressive messages from some other members of her family. I didn't think I was in the wrong, but with so many people upset with me, I think I might be. I brought it up, so maybe I should have left. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I don't see this relationship surviving this. She doesn't see adoption as being a viable path into a family. The comment about cheating because her sister can give birth to a biological kid but doesn't want to? Frankly, I think your girlfriend is a huge jerk. Family is family, doesn't have to be connected by blood. Family is who you choose. This. OP, this woman has shown you who she is. Believe her. I would end things. Yes. To think she's already opening up talks about having OP's parents as in-laws 
Now imagine being family with someone whose notion of family is that warped. Also, not the jerk, but you will be if you carry on being with someone who doesn't consider your younger brother family, just because you don't share the same DNA. Oh, she's a massive jerk. Not the jerk, and genuinely, it's so over-repeated in this sub, but you need to reevaluate this relationship since it seems she fundamentally can't respect a huge aspect of your family. Not the jerk. And you didn't kick her out. She failed to kick you out and then went screaming and stomping to cry to her parents. I'm not going to say straight out break up because I don't know you nor your relationship, but this is a major character flaw and something you should seriously evaluate before moving forward with the relationship. She will never accept over half of your family and will make sure that everyone else around her knows her feelings in the matter. Plus, she will paint you as a bad person after every disagreement, seeing as she had no issue accusing you of pretty bad stuff, and few things are as difficult as repairing a reputation, especially after those sorts of accusations. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Adopted sibling is still a sibling. Your girlfriend's an idiot, bruh. Neighbors finally talking to me now that their actions may result in cutting off access to their property. Looking for advice. I moved into my place early 2020. The new neighbors beside me moved in late 2020. The property line between us, I never really thought about because it was full of trees, shrubs basically. Great privacy for me to enjoy my yard and deck. One day in spring of 2021, I came home and my neighbors had ripped down all of my privacy bushes. I was so mad but since I didn't exactly know where the line was, I just let them know I was not happy now that I can see into their yard. Fast forward throughout the spring and summer last year, they used my property to drive their side-by-side -side through to access their shed, ripping up the nice grass, parking their trailer on my property, mowing portions of my lawn, trying to make it look like it was theirs, and weed whacking my grass. I'm a working mom, property maintenance is not my priority. After every incident or act that I caught them doing, I would talk to them and tell them to get off my property or stop using my property. I was very adamant to keep it simple, always saying, please stop doing that and get off of my property. The second time I caught the wife on my property with a weed whacker, she yelled at me so angry that she had to look over and see my yard was a mess from her property. I pointed out that she's the one who took the shrubbery and privacy barrier down. Anyways. After every encounter, they would stop for a bit and then return to use my property for whatever was convenient to them. It got to the point I sent them a letter to be crystal clear on my boundaries, but they didn't stop. So in late 2021, I paid for a land survey to end the madness and save my sanity. Stakes were all marked, and turns out I have more property than I originally thought. I didn't build anything late last fall because they seemed to have stopped coming over, but they returned from the south after this winter and not even a week in, they were cutting my trees. This is the last straw and is why I'm taking action now. My property line goes through stairs that is their access on this side of the house. I strung up a string along the line and prepared to put up some T-posts last night. They finally came out to talk to me, asking if I'm really going to build a fence through their stairs and that they need access. Citing excuses about the property line and where they thought it was because of other features around, aka not their fault apparently. At this point, I'm pretty much at wit's end and being pretty blunt, saying that the only reason you're wanting to open a line of communication now is because it's affecting you directly. And why would I give you access to my stairs? Basically kind of being a jerk to them. But at the same time, it's all my frustration coming out after a year of being ignored and slowly watching my property get destroyed. My question is, is it petty to build a fence and cut access off to their stairs slash yard on this side of their house? Or is it justified given all the times they could have resolved or even just talked to me about using my property? I am pretty easygoing. I would have probably agreed to some things if they had just talked to me about it beforehand. Edit. Thanks team. I will speak to my partner tonight and show him this thread. My thought now is to draft and send a letter stating to stop using the stairs ASAP due to liability and I will continue to build a temporary fence to ensure this. I will also communicate that we are open to sell a portion of the land because we know they cannot be trusted via friendly neighbors or contracts, and I hate being a jerk and limiting their use of this land, but this is up to them to approach us with a purchase proposal and be open to reasonable negotiation. I think this is the way. Thank you. It's your property. Therefore, I'd be asking if they get hurt on the stairs they use on your property, it could potentially be a liability for you. 
I wouldn't trust them not to hold you accountable if something happened. Therefore, I'd find out what I'm legally able to do and take back every inch of my property and cut off their access to it completely. They're trespassing every time they use those stairs. It's potentially a liability for you and forget them. Had they been considerate neighbors, you would have left them alone. Now they want to play the victim when you exercise your rights as the property owner? No, sorry. Too bad, so sad. Tell them the lesson to be learned from this is to not be a neighbor from heck in the future. Work half day, paid for full. So this happened a few years ago when I was on an apprenticeship at an office job. I had been working there about three months when the story begins. The job I was doing was essentially an admin role. I'd do address and phone number changes on client profiles, send out letters requesting information and sorting out posts that came back. This was all done through the database where I'd get my to-dos from. After a few weeks training, I was picking it up quite quickly. I'm reasonably good with computers and it was a fairly simple system. I made an Excel with a few macros and I was flying through the work. At my three month review with manager, she pulled up my stats and I was more than clearing my daily target to do's. In fact, I was clearing double. Expecting her to say, well done, I was surprised when she instead questioned if I was doing the work correctly. She was concerned that I might have been rushing and making mistakes, although at this stage of the apprenticeship, 10% of my work was being checked by the quality team and I'd passed all my checks which was on the same report she had in her hand. So she set a goal of reducing my amount cleared more in line with the target by the next month. So I decided to scrap the macros and do it all the slow way for a month, double checking everything. It was draining because I was continually focusing on how many I had done that day and making some last longer just to pad out my day and so I would look like I was working. End of the month comes and I have the follow-up meeting. I'm down to about 20% over my daily target so it's obvious I've taken on board what was said and made changes. My quality score is still perfect. Instead of recognizing what I did to try and comply, my manager tells me off about still being over the target and suggests I'm still rushing my work. She scheduled another meeting a month later and that was the end. By the way, both the meetings were documented and I was sent copies of what I had agreed to. Well, here comes the compliance. I started using the macros again and would complete my target in about half my working day, then stop doing anymore. I had to stay in the office for a full day to clock out on time, but I wouldn't do any more to-dos. Now the office had about 150 to 200 staff on site in a few teams, but the room I was in was about 20 people doing the same job as me, and managers rarely came in. After the first day of just sitting on my phone, I decided I needed a project. I found two large bags of rubber bands in the stationary room and had a great idea. So I built a rubber band ball from scratch. Fast forward about two weeks of me doing work in the mornings and rubber band ball building in the afternoons to when the site manager, two levels above my manager, was giving someone from head office a tour. Yes, in the afternoon. Nothing was said, but I knew he wasn't happy by the fact he kept looking over at me while the visitor was talking to other people. Inevitably, next morning, he's invited me to a meeting with him and the floor manager, the level above my manager so I take my notes and go see him. After proving that I had been meeting my target and showing that I had been told not to go over the target, I was sent back to work. Don't know what happened after that, but about an hour later I had an email from my manager telling me to disregard the target and complete as much as I'm able to. She also canceled our meeting. A week or so after that, I was transferred to the team that implemented new processes and had lots of fun completing the apprenticeship by writing and sharing the macros that originally started it all. By the way, rubber band ball is proudly on a shelf at home, 20 centimeters in diameter. Why are companies like this? Wow, they're going so much over their target with no mistakes. Make it stop. That's called, we don't want to let anyone know what we can do at full speed, so please go slower. You're making us all look like slackers. Jobs like that should be salary with weekly targets, so once you're done with your weekly target, you just go home and still get paid for the full week. Am I the jerk for arguing with my husband for the picture he had for my contact photo on his phone? My husband bought a new phone last week. Before that, he used to have one of those old phones that didn't have many features. I was happy for him and helped him learn how to use some features he's never seen before. Yesterday morning, I couldn't find my phone before I went to work. I woke him up to ask him to call me so that I could find it, but he handed me his phone and told me to do it myself. I took his phone, opened the call log and searched for my contact number. I saw that he had a picture of me, my face, for my contact photo. 
I was mad. I woke him up again to ask him why he did that. He said it was normal and he did it with his family and friends even. I told him I didn't give him permission and he should have asked if I was comfortable with having my picture there. He said I have a ton of pictures of him in my phone but I keep them in a hidden app so no one sees them and this way I'm protecting his privacy. Besides, I got permission for every single picture before saving them. I demanded he remove it but he fought back and said I'm being bossy and controlling. I told him my face was there. He again said it wasn't a huge deal and that I should chill. I snapped and said I wasn't going to let him convince me to be okay with this. We fought some more and he removed the picture and kept pouting and venting about how I keep trying to dictate how he lives and what he does and said it's become too much. Info, I live in an area far from home and I don't know anyone here yet and I was worried if he loses his phone, my info will be linked to my photo. You're the jerk. Unless you go through society with a veil on, people are going to see your face. So the privacy argument seems far-fetched. What's the problem? ETA, your husband is right. You are bossy and controlling. It's also just the contact photo, which only he sees unless she calls him or he has his contacts open and people are around. And it would be tiny anyways. That's not even the lock screen or the home screen image like a ton of people have, including myself. Weird hill to die on. I don't use photos on contacts because it's confusing. But seriously? And why does she hide all the photos she takes of him, normal photos, on a secret app? She sounds off. Maybe info is missing and she works for the CIA or something. So withholding judgment until she confirms she's not a secret agent in the wilderness. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.